Radio check, radio check, radio check. This is the Explorer's pod over. Four, three, two, one. Yeah, I saw that you guys you guys had a crazy cold snap yeah. there. I guess you lost a lot of power as well. They shut like, down half the state's power or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I was lucky. I kept my power, but yeah, I'll, my uh, a lot of my plants are dead now. I have some orange trees mm. that are dead, so... Um, it, but th you know, thankfully, I was okay. A lot of people died. It was awful. It was oh my really God! A bad. Uh, yeah, I could just imagine. Bad situation. Yeah, pretty much made national yeah. or international news. Crazy story. What really happened there? Do you know? You know, the bottom lines weren't prepared for it. They they deregulated the the power industry 20 years ago. Okay. And so I just had to sign up for power, and there's like a hundred companies you have to pick from. So it's really this crazy deregulation. The good news is the rates are cheap. Um, the bad news is if we have a cold spell, the, the, all the power goes out. <laughs> so there's, yeah. there's pluses and minuses to it. Yeah, for there's sure. There's pluses and minuses. Sometimes, sometimes a little regulation is a good thing. I'm not a big fan of lots of regulation, but, you know, they, they just need to make sure the plant can operate in really cold weather because it doesn't happen often, but when it happens, it's a disaster. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty bad. Yeah. I, I saw yeah. something cool. I've, I've kind of been following your Twitter recently. I saw you were in Colorado doing some skiing a few weeks back. Yeah. How was that? I I got to post some more stuff. I I've, <laughs> I'm holding on to my um, some of these images. I've got a couple really cool images. Um, in fact, I need to make reservations to go back out there uh, soon. Yeah, I love I love Colorado, and I love I don't ski that much, maybe twice, but um, it's awesome. Cool. Where'd you go? What was the resort? Where'd you spend your time? Um, I go to a place called ski cooper it's this really mm -hmm. small uh resort out near leadville okay. um, and the snow is amazing and they they've got i don't know 20 or 30 runs it's not a, they, they just a couple of lifts uh and there's nobody there i don't i i never wait more than zero seconds literally the whole time i was there i just skied right on the wow the lift. right up to and, the lift um, cool it's good it's not you know it's not well they do have some double diamonds i like the blues i'm mm -hmm more of a blue uh, skier and uh it's just awesome if you want to learn how to snowboard it's great because it's not too crowded and um it's beautiful it's great it's and it's it's probably a third of the cost of the big mountains you know of Vail. um so i i'm a big fan of ski cooper i kind of don't want to say that though because i don't want big crowds yeah right hey hey, hey hey keep like that keep gem. that down it's top secret <laughs> yeah right it, it's pretty awesome yeah get it i i did some skiing in colorado when i was younger we went to steambroke springs a few times and uh -huh. it was the best the absolute best snow i've ever been in it's an incredible place steamboat's cool i yeah. I, I actually we went there after uh after uh cooper so i was there a couple weeks ago steamboat oh, you uh, i didn't ski there lucky. but i had dinner there cool it's a great great town I, sorry one one last thing i i, yeah. I, I want to talk about uh because you're you're in houston now yeah. i i presume i am i saw that uh yeah, yeah, just this morning that uh, the governor lifted all the mandates in uh, Texas for COVID. And I, I've been meaning to tweet. I'm like, hey, y'all, we got to we got to keep on masking up because Houston is actually has Houston's a great town. It is the first city, I think, in the world or at least in America that has all five major variants of COVID at the same time. So this is not the time. You know, something simple like keeping your mask on is, it's just polite. You know, I don't want to be around people without masks on. So okay. I hope people, even though the even though the mandate's not there, I hope people still wear masks because uh, um, I don't want to get breathed on by somebody with COVID, to be honest. <laughs> I haven't had the vaccine yet. So um, right. I'm, I'm try I haven't <clears throat> gotten it yet. And I'm trying to avoid getting it. But I also don't want to stay in my house all the time. So a mask is a good, um, you know, pretty easy thing to do to avoid that. Right. Yeah, well, I, I like the idea that it's a choice. And, you know, I think there's a lot of edu educated people out there are going to do the right thing. So let's hope for the best. But it's great yeah. to hear that at least uh, the state's loosening up on, you know, people are going to be able to go back to work again. So that's positive. Oh, yeah. Well, Texas has been at work. We haven't. The, I, I love that. Um, you know, the place has been open. Restaurants are open. The mall's mm -hmm. open. Um, you know, they're you've been able to live life. I, I think other places really did hard lockdowns. And so it's actually been pretty good in Texas. Um, you know, if you need to go 
to the mall to get a pair of shorts or whatever, you can do that. Uh, it's just it's good to wear masks so you don't breathe on other people right. while you're while you're doing that. Yeah, we've had it pretty hard right. here in uh, in the Philippines. We've been locked down now for a year, and we live in an, we're an island nation. And to travel amongst the islands, if you if you take a ferry when you arrive, you have to you have to spend two weeks in quarantine. So it's pretty difficult, and we we really run on tourism where we're at, and that's obviously shut down. No one's allowed to come here for a year now. Yeah. So that's we're brutal. we're reinventing ourselves here. This is our new right. thing. <laughs> so doing podcasts. Yeah, you know, <laughs> Janet and I've been uh, guiding expeditions in the Himalayas and uh, here in Palawan, some uh, island boat expeditions for about wow. ten years now. So wow. that sort of came to an end last March. And All right. Here we are trying this new yeah. thing. I was speaking for a living, so I I, 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 I was doing basically paid speaking to put food on the table, and that came to an end, you know, a year ago. So, I feel your pain. Yeah, um, man. Yeah. The, <laughs> this year's taxes are much different than last year's taxes. <laughs> taxes. Yeah, all of us are really uh, going through a lot of challenges, but. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Colonel Terry Verts, finally, it's really nice to meet you and talk to you. Here we are, you know, we've really uh, been very excited uh, to have this day and to have this uh, interview with you. And uh, we may not have a snowstorm here, but we're welcoming <laughs> you from a warm, hot summer in the Philippines. <laughs> so <clears throat> welcome and thank you, thank oh, you wow. so much for your time. We know that you're very busy, but we are really very grateful and honored that you're here with us in our podcast. Yeah, Welcome. thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, yeah. we had to turn the fans <laughs> off, and it's hot as hell. <laughs> we don't want the fan to mess up the audio. <laughs> uh. Yeah. Bit... Okay. Right. Uh, sorry about that. I can no. see the sweat. Yeah, you can see it. <laughs> okay. We're in the tropics. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Do the honor. Yeah. yeah, so tell us a little bit about your childhood. Tell us about the formative years. Give us a little ba bit of background uh, about your history, a little snatch uh, from your past. So I had a pretty like typical American um, uh, middle class background. I was in Maryland um, in between Baltimore and Washington. I had uh, my my mom was a secretary actually at NASA, NASA Goddard. It's a like a unmanned NASA space center. And uh, my dad also worked there. He was a technician um, and my, my parents were divorced. So my stepdad was an engineer and he built instruments that went on satellites. So cool. he has a pretty cool distinction. He, he built um, ion mass spectrometers and magnetometers. So instruments to help satellites navigate basically right and on. do science. And uh, his stuff has been to every planet in the solar system and has wow. left the solar okay. system. Wow. So he had a pretty cool career building instruments. Those were kind of NASA's hate full time. It's a cool now, by the way, there's really cool stuff going on. So, you know, I chopped wood and had, we had a wood burning stove. That was my job was to start a fire <laughs> to heat the house. And, um, uh, I went to public school. I went to a great public school in Howard County, you know, it was a public school. So I kind of had a normal childhood, right? And normal in American 70s, childhood. 80s, it was pretty awesome. Cool. Yes. Yeah. You know, I was really lucky because my parents, you know, my mom and my dad didn't go to college, but they really supported me. So all this stuff that I was doing, they like, they kind of had never done themselves, but they, they got me a camera. So I had to teach myself photography and they got me a TRS-80 computer and I had to teach myself basic. Mm -hmm. um, and my dad got me a telescope and I had to teach myself where the stars were and how to, you know, find galaxies and planets and all that kind of stuff. So um, it was really good for me to learn how to do that stuff on my own, mm -hmm. um, which was uh, it kind of teaches you self reliance and independence, mm -hmm. and that that was really important for me. Yeah, I yeah. sort of I've kind of been on that journey my as well as well. I you know I taught myself how to climb and how to uh, be a sailor. I taught myself you know I basically oh, wow. picked up the book uh, Sailing for Dummies and <clears throat> bought my first boat and. The next year, I took off to sail around the world when I was 26 years old. So I had to really learn how to become. That sounds safe. <laughs> every, every mom's nightmare. Totally. You know, but not, it's, and, I, you know I had a girlfriend yeah, at the time, awesome. and they were like, nah, you're not going with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. But I, uh, I, I, I know the, the spirit. When I was 
um, I don't know, 16, I went to live in Finland. I lived with a family on an exchange. So I, you know, was mm -hmm. gone at age 16. I was 17. I went to the Air Force Academy and I haven't been back since. So, um, yeah, I have that wandered lust, I guess, also. Yeah. <laughs> so when I was younger, I had, uh, I had a teacher. His name was Pat Gavin. He's my sixth grade teacher. And he was really a brilliant guy. And uh, he's one of my great mentors, young mentors, you know. And I sort of took a lot of his spirit and the lessons that he gave me through through my journey of life. Do you have anybody like that from your childhood? Yeah, I have Mr. Thrasher. Uh, he was like <laughs> the seventh grade social studies teacher. And uh, uh, teacher, I, I, his name just this escape me. Um, Mr. Craig was my math teacher in high school. You know, I've been writing a lot. I was actually just writing right before this podcast. I finished a scene. I'm writing a screenplay. Oh, and, right. um, I was probably the least likely to write a book in high school because I was sucked at English. Yeah. And my, I tortured my English teachers. And now here I am writing. Awesome. Um, so it's, uh, it's funny how, and I, my English teachers, I remember very well. My French teacher, I remember very well. I ended up minoring in French and yeah. I did an exchange at the French Air Force Academy and right. I, I'm, I speak French a lot and that teacher that I had in high school is the reason why. Um, cool. And so it's it's amazing what an impact teachers can yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, I think so as well. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, so, you know, when I was younger, I, I, you know, I didn't read a lot of books, but eventually, you know, when I started sailing, I really got into reading because I got a lot of free time laying in my bunk. But uh, when I was younger, I uh, picked up a book called Cosmos by Carl Sagan, mm -hmm. and that had a pretty profound impact on me. Do you have any books similar to that? Do you have any books that grounded yeah. you? Absolutely. book I read, like the first book I read in kindergarten or whatever was about Apollo, and that kind of inspired me really? to be an astronaut. <laughs> and then when I was 13, I read The Right Stuff cool. uh, by Tom Wolfe. Yeah. And there, it's a great movie. Um, there's a new Nat Geo. Is doing, I was just started watching the series. I actually met the crew of this new series after last world record where we flew around the earth and I directed a, oh, oh, yeah. I directed yeah. my first documentary uh, called one more orbit. And as after we landed, the, the crew of the right stuff was there just to oh, learn about awesome. here's wow. the space center and here's what it's like to be an astronaut. So I walked over and they were so excited. They're like meeting a real astronaut. It was really cool. And I was picking out, all right, you're Alan Shepard and you're Gus Grissom. I was just <laughs> guessing and I was right. <laughs> actually even the wives they had the astronaut wives were there the actresses were there and um so anyways so the right stuff i was the book i read that question the same way the right stuff impacted a lot of us that's cool yeah nice book I like well that. yeah on. speaking of books uh how is your virtual book tour going for your new <laughs> book how to for the right astronaut I, I yeah. astronaut yeah yeah Ooh. yeah i've got it over here oh cool um, <clears throat> we, we're gonna throw a screenshot up when we uh present it so <laughs> yeah we'll, okay yeah really good it's the publisher is called workman um they're in new york they're amazing they're so good they have gotten really big stories and lots of different press and um so like they could not have done more to promote the book it's gotten lots of really great reviews by book reviewers and mm -hmm. so they did a great job they were going to send me on a 20 city <clears throat> book tour yeah and instead it was like a, it was a couple weeks of zoom calls um <laughs> Which is which is good and bad. They say the only thing worse than being out on a book tour is not being on a book tour. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, so it, it's a lot of work to travel and signing books all the time. But when you're, but it's also gives you that adrenaline rush. So um, it was a bummer to have to do it via Zoom, but it was really fun writing it, and mm -hmm. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from it. So people seem to like the How to Astronaut book. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I, I just started reading a little bit of it uh, the last couple of days, you know, through the first few pages on uh, Amazon where you can sort of uh, start right. to read the book. Hope right. to get a copy of that. But I saw you on yeah, we'll Joe. Have to, we'll have them send you. Yeah, that'd be great. Oh, that's... Copy. Or you can video uh, version read, read by the author. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> L let's do that that'd for cool. sure. Um, yeah, I saw you a couple of weeks back on Joe Rogan. Uh, I was just sort of checking out the Joe Rogan show with you on it, and I saw you had a T-shirt on it that said, it's not rocket surgery. I'm guessing it has to do with your book. What's that all about? I've gotten so many about that T-shirt. I wish I, I should have been a brand ambassador for that. that whatever. <laughs> so, you know, people, it's kind of a joke. Uh, I think I 
there's even a chapter in my book called it's not rocket surgery right um mm -hmm. about uh doing medical training but um you know people the joke is it's not rocket science mm -hmm. or it's not brain surgery so I, it's just a mix of the two oh okay <laughs> it's not rocket surgery which is like even harder than rocket science or brain surgery mm -hmm. <laughs> that is a cool shirt <laughs> Yeah, you know we've yeah. all we've all we've all heard of the uh, the Mile High Club, the Mile High, High Club, right? <laughs> we've all heard of that. Uh, Two hundred twenty days in space is a long time. Is there such a thing as a low Earth orbit club? Can you give us the devil in the detail on chapter twenty nine? Well, I'll I'll tell you what. <coughs> you need to read the book <laughs> because there's a chapter called. There's a chapter called it was a long 200 days. So you might find the answer in that chapter or you might get you might guess it from the title of the chapter. Yeah, uh, we, we that, were, that, we, that makes it more exciting. Yeah, I, I agree with him, Todd. Okay. You have to read the book. Mm. <laughs> I was hoping to get the dirty stuff today. <laughs> nah. <laughs> so I was telling you, I, was, yeah, I sailed around the world. Things. I sailed around the world for about 20 years of my, uh, you know, the second half of my life. And uh, it was sort of an old rickety rocket ship. I actually sailed around the world without an engine. So it's a different story. But one of the things that always seems to come into play on these journeys, and I'm, I'm presuming they do in space travel as, as well, is like some story about the toilet or the head. Can you tell us about when nature calls or the glamour of, travel, of space travel? <laughs> that chapter? So <laughs> space, you know, this is like the most common question. Uh, couple of different ways to deal with that. First of all, we have diapers for launch okay. and landing and doing spacewalks. Wow. Because you're in your suit for hours and hours and hours. And that suit is big and bulky and you can't get out. Right. And uh, they, the American suit had, we called it the jaws of death, like this big zipper that, you know, if you had to go, you could brave the jaws of death. <laughs> but, um, you know, you really didn't want to do that. So no way. <laughs> there is a diaper for that. Okay. Um, but... The, the normal space toilet, once you're in space, there's basically a hook for one and a can for number two, and uh, airflow keeps everything going in the right direction. Right. So it works well um, the way the stuff, so it doesn't stink or anything mm -hmm. like that. It's a pretty complicated system. We use the Russian toilet, and we recycle the urine into the American system, and that urine is turned back into water and oxygen, which wow. is pretty amazing. Wow. So it's a it's a really complicated recycling system that's an amazing system. It's just complicated and it, it tends to break and there's a lot of effort keeping it going. But it works and it you know, in space there's no water. So unless you you, you know, being able to recycle that is a really big deal. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. Well you mentioned about the space walks. Uh Todd and I are both dive instructors. Tell us uh, a little bit about uh, your training underwater for yeah. space walks. Absolutely. Yeah. So the NBL is our pool in Houston. It's the NASA acronym for big pool. And um, uh, <laughs> they've got a mock up of the space station. It's only about half the space station because the station is so big. They used to have a space shuttle and they used to have a Hubble Space Telescope, but now they just have the space station. Um, and they actually have some commercial things. So like uh, the oil rig companies will use it um, to do helicopter ditching training. Right. Yeah. You know, in case your helicopter goes in the water, how do you get out? Yeah. Right. So there are some commercial people that use that pool, but for the most part, it's NASA. And you put on your big spacesuit, it's the same spacesuit, except for it has an air hose. Um, in space, there's no air hose, it's actually a backpack with air tanks. Right. And we have divers that are safety divers and technical divers that follow you around and you know just make sure you're safe. Um, buoyancy is a big problem, as you know, and the, sure. when you're diving, you've got your BC and you put the air in and let it out. Um, you can't do that in a spacesuit, so these big foam blocks that they stuff in your spacesuit to change the buoyancy or weights, mm -hmm. it just depends on uh, the equipment you're lugging around and mm -hmm. your body. Like if you're a little skinny, fifth percentile female, you're just, you have lots of You're room. walking you're around in the suit. The suit. If you're, I'm not that big, but I have a I have a really big chest and I barely fit in the extra large suit. Like wow. my, I can't wow. take a full breath even in the extra large uh, okay. torso. So each, everybody has a different um, number of um, uh, foam or metal that they have to stuff in there to give you neutral buoyancy and also neutral angle. Like you don't want your left foot sticking up or your head leaning back or, you know, they got to get the, the angle correct also. Right. So 
the safety divers have a really it's it's an art they have sure. a tough job wow um, yeah that sounds like some pretty cool i know trick. this is why I, I, you know i was also reading about those suits that uh they're rigged with uh I, I guess what you call thrusters so that if you ever did become untethered in space you could actually pilot yourself around have you used right. those they have used those for training um you know, when we first started building the space station, I think Mike L.A. Lopez Alegria was the first astronaut to fly with that um, back in 2000, 2000 maybe. Mm -hmm. It was a long time ago. So it's a it's a jet pack on the back of the spacesuit with little, uh, I think it's CO2 cartridges. Yeah, right. Uh, that, it's all... You know, they squirt out carbon dioxide and that pushes you. And so if you did accidentally float away, you could use this to control yourself and then fly back to the station there's not a lot of gas in that we practice that in it's the sh VR it's short flight environment yeah. and you have to be like there's no extra gas um i'm actually working on this vr experience uh with a canadian company to let you do a spacewalk you know in vr wow. it's a it, it's an amazing experience. wow they put together a really cool totally graphics. cool um hopefully it'll be coming out soon we've been working on it for a long time but um one of the tasks like we have spacewalk you have to go repair this piece of equipment that's broken. That's one of our tasks. And the other one is you have to, you know, fly back to the station. So it's a pretty cool, it's a pretty cool wow. system. Thank I'm in. We haven't had to use it for real because people don't let go. Yeah. <laughs> they keep a hold of the station. Yeah. Exactly. Well, back in 2007, um, I was one of the first uh, Filipinas and first women in the world who has uh, summited Everest or traversed Everest from the north side from China and back down to the south side in Nepal and um, we had three years of training before that um, from 2004 to 2007 and one of the things that really was very crucial in our climb is that we were required to sign a waiver uh, stating that we are you know sane and we voluntarily uh, commit ourselves in this endeavor, in this risky endeavor, and whatever is uh, may happen to us, we're accountable, and we we know what we're doing. And we were asked to choose what uh, we wanted to do with our bodies if we die during the climb. It's either our bodies will be retrieved, or it will be left in the mountains. And I think I chose. To be left in the mountains at least i'll be preserved forever <laughs> right. but uh you know i'm leading to this, to this question because there was a um a part in your book it says uh what to what do you do when a fellow astronaut expires and is there such right. thing you know such thing uh waiver and everything uh, when you work? go to to space what happens when your partner expires yeah that's a great question. So um, I don't think I signed anything uh, from uh, from NASA about that. Um, although I do think for space tourists, and that's becoming uh, uh, you know a thing now, they're going to have to really think twice before they take that risk because spaceflight is never going to be perfectly safe. Um, so that risk that you take is something that you have to, you know, actively take. Of course, as an astronaut, we knew about it. I'm actually writing a project right now about Columbia. Yeah. Um, I teach a case at Harvard Business School on Saturday about Columbia and Challenger, you know, the accidents that, yeah. that killed the crews, unfortunately. So it's definitely a risk. Um, my hat's off to you for going up Everest because that, that's something I could never. Some buddies of mine are, they've got a, a film project to go film at Everest. And um, they were asking me to get involved. And I said, look, man. Maybe I'll go to base camp, but that's that's as far as I'm going. <laughs> I'm not going any farther than that. Yeah. Um, we should I, I, I definitely I definitely mean, I, go to base camp. Capable. Yeah, we yeah. can take you to base camp. <laughs> that's cool. I would love to go to base camp. Yeah, yeah that one take for me sure. There, but I, I I'm not going to go beyond that. I <laughs> I suck at aerobics. Um, I just I my body is not built for aerobics. Maybe um, aerobics in this space. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll... In space, it's a lot easier. Yeah, <laughs> pull ups are a lot easier in space. So what you would do with your body, you know, we didn't. Honestly, um, but I did write the book. I tried to divide in the kind of easy to read short essays, mm -hmm. and you can read it in any order if you want to 
you don't have to start at one and end at 51. There's 51 short essays. Uh, you can read it in any order. But the chapter about that was kind of, what would you do? You could either bring them back, you know, put them in a spacesuit, strap them in their couch in the capsule and bring them back, which would be kind of awkward to be flying in a spaceship. Wow, with that on, the, on the but, you know, ride home, yeah. They, you could put them in a SpaceX cargo ship, which also comes back to Earth safely. Oh, okay. um, And then, you know, they could have a proper burial on Earth. Uh, you could do a burial at sea, kind right. of put, push them out the airlock, do a spacewalk, have a ceremony, and mm -hmm. and do that. And they would, you know, they would burn up in the atmosphere. Or you could put them in one of the other cargo ships that burns up in the atmosphere. Okay. Oh. Be kind of like a burial at sea. Um, if you're on another planet, you know, you'd have you'd have the first ever space cemetery. Um, you'd have to find a part of the planet and and leave them there. If it's a place like Mars, we're, we're really careful about contaminating Mars with DNA because, you know, there's yeah. implications there. Mm -hmm. um, so they may want to bring them back, although that's a long trip back from Mars to bring, you know, 200 pounds of, of body and yeah. whatever. So yeah. anyway, there, it's an interesting question. Thankfully, we haven't had to deal with it. But, yeah. you know, pe people are not we don't last forever That's <laughs> yeah. right. and, and if we fly in space for long enough it's it's eventually going to happen the life is I, i'm pretty sure the 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 psychological factor you know the training that you are prepared for anything is really a, a significant part of your training and the whole right it's like it has yeah. to be part of that that that's why they give us t-38 jets well they don't give us they lend them to us <laughs> um, they're air force supersonic trainers and it's how i went to pilot training 30 years ago when i was a second lieutenant in the t-38 and as astronauts we fly in those not to learn how to land a t-38 but to be in a jet going 500 miles an hour that and there's thunderstorms and you're low on gas and you have to work with your crewmate and if you don't do it right you might die and so that like being in risky situations is something that um, really helps your mental ability yes. and, and state. Um, so um, anyway, that that yeah. uh, it, it's hard to train that. I think it's maybe more of a characteristic, your ability to um, compartmentalize. And, it, and it's not your ability to not worry necessarily. It's your ability to just say, that's... That's what it is. I'm going to take worry and stick it in this room in my brain and lock yeah. the door and later. Um, I was just I just wrote a scene uh, uh, similar to that. Okay. Yeah. How my character was comfortable. It's something that fighter pilots do and astronauts do, and it's it's a it's a good survival it's a good survival mechanism. Yeah, because it just gets in the way. Having that, uh, it's a terrible way to have a relationship. Uh, you, it's a bad way to be a spouse, but it's a good way to be an astronaut. <laughs> I like that one. We'll get that. we'll get into analogy. that later. <laughs> but right now, um, you have a lifelong passion for photography. Where did that all start? Mm -hmm. It's really um, nice. Yeah, these are some photos I took from space. Cool. Uh, and I kind of squeezed them all together to make a background in my in my studio. Um, so that started when I was a kid. Uh, my parents got me a camera. It was a Konica SLR camera, so you had to drop the film in and thread it, and then wind it yeah. and take the picture it's and wind manual. it and what's that eventually i got this power <laughs> winder attachment you put a bunch of double a batteries and uh -huh. so you it would it would advance oh, automatically. Right. Yeah. Right? So you go to a sports game and, high tech anyway so i had to learn about focus and shutter speed and aperture and iso and you know it was it was really good and then i you'd send off the little cartridge of 36 so it would take me a month or two to take 36 pictures and then you'd mail it off and there was this cheap place for two dollars and 99 cents they'd process your pictures and send them back and so i've got a big <laughs> tub of all these old pictures that i took back in the 70s and 80s um but that was great it's it i learned yeah. how to take pictures and you know i just always had a camera around my neck yeah. um had a canon uh eos canon ae1 actually for probably 10 years or more um and I've got a couple different cameras now, but yeah, I've always yeah. been a camera person. My my kids, when they were growing up, were like, Dad, stop taking pictures. <laughs> but now, well, this is the camera now, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty high quality as well. It's amazing. You it's know, the, amazing. the IMAX, I, was, I got into photography and started doing films when I was younger as well. I actually, which I'll get into here a little bit later, but the IMAX, as far as I remember, it used to be like a 70 mil 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, and when you were shooting IMAX, I'm presuming it was a digital format. What's the difference now? We made the first ever digital IMAX space film. Okay. Wow. So, and, and my director of photography is a guy named James Nyhaus, and his, uh, his handle is at 70MMDP, so 70mm right. 70 director of photography. Uh, so in the old days, the first five or six space IMAX movies, which I saw them all when I was a kid, I would go to Air and Space Museum yeah. and watch To Fly in 1976. Mm, I was a little I kid. Remember I remember those. To Fly, amazing movie. And then Tony Myers was the director for Hail Columbia, Blue Planet, The Dream is Alive, all these like iconic IMAX movies back in the 80s and 90s. And I watched them all. And then one day when I was at NASA, I looked on, you know, I went, what's on my schedule today? Um, and it said IMAX training. I said, hmm, this is wow. awesome. And I went and Tony Myers was there and James Nyhaus, the so director cool. of photography. And a fellow a ret retired astronaut, Marsha Ivins, was there. And she had filmed a couple of the previous IMAX films, so Space Station and I think another one. But um, so I got to film an IMAX movie when I was in space. It was the most important thing I did in space in over seven months. Uh, it was the funnest thing I did. And I just lucked out. It just happened to be they were making the movie while I was in space. There was no thing. But Tony, when I directed this One More Orbit film last year, Tony was my inspiration. I dedicated the film to her at the end. Um, and so it was uh, it was really cool. To answer your question, those early IMAX movies had big, giant cartridges of film, mm -hmm. 70 millimeters. Yeah. And she did them in huge. 3D. The Space Station 3D and Hubble were both 3D. Mm -hmm. So you had to run two sets of film shooting through the camera at oh, okay. tens of feet per second. Right. Yeah. So each, each box of film was only three minutes. So on several shuttle missions, they launched with three minutes of film. So you didn't want to don't screw up. Have two takes. You had one take. <laughs> That's right. Um, and you know you practiced it, and you made sure the focus was good because one of the lessons I learned was if it's out of focus a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, they just throw it away. It's not going to be useful. So our film was the first ever digital IMAX movie. We had a Canon um, C500, kind of like a Hollywood video camera, mm -hmm. and a Canon 1DC, which is one of those you know Super Bowl cameras a still mm -hmm. camera yeah and we use a still camera to take pictures of the earth so you'd set it at two or four frames a second and hit the button and it would you know G -g 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 take mm -hmm. take a bunch okay. of still pictures right and then we'd send them to the ground downlink them and the imax software wizards would pr put them into this amazing video okay mm -hmm. um it's and the movie's called a beautiful planet i think hulu disney it's a disney owns everything now so basically they're you know they have bought Earth, and uh, <laughs> so to watch, they had the IMAX films on Disney, if you have that, or on Hulu, too. I think it was showing on Hulu. Anyway, so the Earth scenes were all through the still camera, and the scenes inside of the other astronauts were on the video camera. So there were several of us astronauts that filmed it, but I took a really strong <clears throat> you know, mm. interest in doing the IMAX movie, and I, I spent a lot of time working on that film. It was awesome. I loved it. Yeah, yeah. great, great work. Yes. So, yeah. but they, real quick, real quick. Yeah, yeah, digital, sure. Digital. Oh, thanks. It allowed us to do night pictures. Cause oh, right. The film, as you, you know, as you know, is is set for day. You could have night film, but they didn't. So that mm. we had the first ever night images of the aurora, and of oh. lightning at night. Those are two really cool scenes. Yeah, I saw movie. those. And um, also, I, I had a GoPro. It was actually a Russian GoPro. Mm -hmm. The Russians went to Best Buy, bought some GoPros, boxes to keep them in, and they, they lent me this GoPro. I borrowed it from them. <laughs> and on my spacewalk, and took a couple of GoPro footages, and Tony edited into this amazing spacewalking montage. Cool. And also, it was in the Soyuz. So you can see me and Anton and Samantha getting in the Soyuz and um, doing uh, doing that. So the, the digital really opened up. Yeah, a lot of stuff. It's not sure. film, but it allowed you to do it on a spacewalk and it allowed you to take it in the Soyuz, which you you can't take this. It's massive, not possible. You know, IMAX camera. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, there's always a, a a pros and cons. You know, when when we summited Everest, uh, we were advised to bring a backup, which is a manual camera. Although we have a digital camera, just in case it fluctuates and it drains the battery, so we have a backup camera and. You know, you have to take pictures in the summit. That's the most important thing. Right, right. <laughs> so we did that. So uh, I can I can totally uh, see 
the advantages and of course a little bit disadvantages for now so yeah that's that's cool with IMAX where um, so, w- where can our audience find your work your photography work yeah we'll pull that that's clip a good up question um, I have a website terryverch.com okay um, and I actually there's a couple of galleries that want to you know sell some of my work on really high quality you know glass prints or what like what I have behind me Mm-hmm. Um, and the one contract just expired and I'm still waiting to sign another one. So that hasn't been done cool. yet. There's a, there's a gallery in Kansas city. Um, and I'm going to f- remember the name here in a second, but there's a photo gallery in Kansas city Dude. that, that did these arts, mm-hmm. arts two work or three years ago, something on your um, website. There was a link to like artsworks.com yeah. or something. Yeah. And there's another entrepreneur, like entrepreneur, only entrepreneur. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, they, that's, an, that's a website that has my stuff. So that's probably the, actually if if you're really interested, go to entrepreneur. Entrepreneur, okay. And they have my work there. Okay. Now, your fellow astronaut Buzz Aldrin, a mentor and a close friend, yeah. wrote the foreword for your book, "View from he Above." Did. Can you tell he us did. a little bit about this book as well? So that was my first book. I don't think I have. I don't have a copy of it. Um, I wrote that book almost four years ago now. Um, I wrote it over four years ago. Wow, it's a National Geographic photography book, um, and it's re- what I try to do is take a space flight in book format. So mm-hmm. um, the chapters are just describing what space flight is like. But it was really you know, photography, you know, like a coffee table kind of book. Okay, um, it was awesome. I wrote that book in two weeks. Wow! Uh, I left NASA literally the week I left NASA. I knew I wanted to write this book, and I I talked to the Nat Geo editor, and um, so I set my alarm at 8 a.m. I was at my computer typing. And uh, usually by noon, I was done. I'm like, all right, my brain's full. So I'd go to the pool, have a beer. And then the next morning, I'd set my alarm, wake up, and I wrote it. And I did a chapter a day. Uh, and after two weeks, you know, it was 10 chapters, 11 chapters, mm-hmm. something like that. And plus a foreword and an acknowledgments and stuff. It was done. Nice um, job. Good work. Off. And, that was the first draft and then we you know we went back and forth but that was my first book that i wrote and it was a lot of fun writing it yeah for uh congratulations on another book yes yeah Yeah. so you know you've gone through a lot of uh training in your life to get selected for the space shuttle it's quite a rigorous job i'm sure Uh, what was the interview like with nasa and what do you remember the most you know that's I think that's a story I've never told in any of my books. Um, I have to keep that in mind. Um, the biggest thing about the interview was that I shouldn't have been there. I was I was still um, a student at test pilot school, and on the application, it's like test pilot school attended and year graduated and test experience. That's one of the sections you have to fill out, out as an astronaut, or at least you did back in the day before when we had the space shuttle, mm-hmm. and it was like. Like I'm still a, you know, so we everybody at Edwards Air Force Base wants to be an astronaut. So, but a lot of my classmates didn't apply, and mm. I'm like, why not? Man? Yeah, I know I'm too young, but this is why I'm here. I'm gonna, you know, I didn't apply when I was in college because I knew I was too young. But I'm like, all right, I'm I'm a test pilot. Let's try it. And you know, the first round happens, and they they're checking on my application. They're calling my references. And everybody's like, ooh, and everybody's checking, you know, who's who got the references checked, who got this. And then I get an interview, and everybody at Edwards was, was a thousand percent. You're not going to get picked. You're just a young guy. And I'm like, you're right. I'm not going to get picked, but this is cool. I'm going to go yeah. on at NASA. And I did a practice interview with my buddies. So we sat around a table and they grilled me. And that was so important because interviewing can be awkward yeah. unless you're calm and used to it. And, um, it's not a normal thing unless you've done it before. So doing that practice, I think, helped me a lot. And then you, when you finally get to Houston, it was a week-long interview. Now they do – they bring you down twice. They bring like 120 people down at first, and then 40 people come down for the second round or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but for us, it was just the whole group came down once. And uh, so I was able – and it's shaped like a T, and they put the interviewee at the crotch of the T. Mm-hmm. So you've got – like some people are over there and some people are over there and it's it, oh, it's wow. weird it doesn't yeah. make it's any a sense different like, why are they doing this totally. different setup but they they do it i think just to mess with you yeah get in um, your head a bit 
they just uh, they're just trying to mess with you and right. see if you're gonna what you're like under pressure and you know i was talking and one of the astronauts interviewers was pregnant and uh oh. so like she was asleep <laughs> and um one of that one of the senior managers was really he was on the softball team he was into baseball and when he found out i like baseball so he perked up oh, would you play on the astronaut softball team and i was like yes sir i'll be there for practice this week <laughs> i'm on the team to. and right and uh, i that i think was a big part of why i got picked is because he want needed people for the softball team and i like baseball. <laughs> And, um, and I, the other thing, I had done that French Air Force Academy exchange when I was in the academy, and the chief astronaut had also done the same exchange mm -hmm. at the same academy uh, 10 years before me. And so when I was at Edwards, we needed a guest speaker for our, our some event. And so I didn't know him, but I called the astronaut office, and he came to, to speak. So that was probably another thing that helped me out. But I think the, one of the things that was probably the most important for me was I just wasn't uptight. I was like, yeah, I get to hang out with astronauts. Like, right. this was cool. I didn't, I didn't worship them like celebrities yeah. or something. I just was, it would be myself. a great job. I didn't These, have a lot of my people. On myself. I just had fun. And yeah. I think what now that I'm an astronaut and I know what they're looking for, they just want somebody they want to hang out with. Right. I yep. mean, all hundred, isn't that how it always super is? Super smart technical people, but you don't necessarily want to hang out with all of them. So right. they have the luxury of being able to pick who they want to pick. Cool. That's great. That's really a great story. You should write about that. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Another thing uh, on that topic, you got selected, if I remember, it's around 2000 for NASA, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Somewhere I was there. in class of 2000. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. you are in class of 2000. And just after that uh, was the, the, tr the Columbia tragedy, mm -hmm. right? So I'm guessing some of these were your classmates and friends and was some really hard times at NASA. But you didn't do your first space flight for quite a few years after. Right. What, how do you spend your time? What do you do there during those years? Yeah, that was rough. So Columbia, I'm, this is what I was writing right before my podcast I'm about Columbia. Because uh, I was right in the middle of it. I was what they call a family escort. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And your job is to go down for launch and for landing. <coughs> excuse me. Launch and landing with the, with the families, um, mm -hmm. you know, while the crew's in space. And so I was... I was right in the middle of that whole thing. Wow. Um, and then, so in the 90s, NASA hired way too many astronauts. And then they had a problem on STS-93, uh, Eileen Collins' first command, and with some wiring, and that really delayed everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then they had uh, this space station they had to build. And so this, this was, these were really complicated missions, and they didn't fly any rookies on them because it was so complicated, they, only, they thought they could only fly flown astronaut so it was great for the old guys but for the new guys it sucked sure um and then columbia happened and that slowed everything down mm. so all of these problems compiled and pa compiled on top of each other um and people my age decade um, Andrew, it was a great mission it was the final space station mission assembly flight and uh, we brought up something called the cupola which is this big seven windowed dome uh, which i took all these pictures from so it was worth the wait, but uh, you know, by yeah. year eight, I was like, "All right, I'm ready to fly." It's been, yeah. I've been enough pretend. This has been pretend astronaut for long enough. It's time to fly. Um, but the problem is, you can't ever complain. Like you, the, sure. you're an astronaut. You're day, stoked to your be Your day there. job is pretty cool, even if you're not flying in space. You get to fly T-38s and do spacewalk training and go to the gym as part of your job. So um, it was it was a great job, but it, that wait, you know. It's, it's a there, long one. Yeah. There comes a point where you can only answer the question, oh, you're an astronaut. When did you fly? <laughs> I haven't flown yet. You can only answer that question Ouch. so many times. Yeah. 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 Well. Oh, so you're, when, when do you become a real astronaut? Or you're not really an astronaut. Right. <laughs> yes. It does get old after a while. Exactly. <laughs> well, other than the scenes in the movie, Terry, how would you describe your training in layman's term, you know, those or a description long, before going to those space? Those long, arduous years. <laughs> Tell us about the your people training. who do not have any idea or background about, you know, with space science and being an astronaut. Yeah. Well, I tried to do that and how to astronaut. I tried to write it for anybody. You know, it's men and women, old and young. It's it's definitely not for space nerds. I tried to break it down and like. A relatable fun and wow kind of way mm -hmm. um, but the training is diverse it's not the same thing every day um, 
when you're assigned to a flight is when you're really busy with training. If you're not, if you're an astronaut and you're not assigned to a flight, then you do other ground jobs like work on the new programs that are coming up, just going to meetings with engineers and helping them design a rocket. Or I was at Capcom for five years where I would go to mission control and I was the guy talking on the radio to the crew in space. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was in charge of the T-38 program for a while. So, you know, the, we have safety briefings and equipment and whatever. I was kind of the person. So you have these different jobs, but when you're in training, um, first of all, being in shape is important. So you got to go to the gym a lot. Uh, you have to do spacewalk training, you do science experiment training, um, you do systems training, like how does the space station communication system work or the recycling system or the, the thermal control system or whatever. Um, uh, and like for me, I had to do IMAX training. So I got to learn wow. how to yeah. uh, film a movie, which was fun. That was not had to, that was, I got to. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of, uh, a, a lot of training. You have to go to Russia a lot because they're an important part of our international space station. Mm -hmm. So to learn their systems, of course, I launched on a Soyuz, so I had to learn their launch vehicle. Um, most crews now will be going up on a Boeing or SpaceX capsule, right. but some will still go up on the Russian Soyuz, which I love. That was really great training. I love doing that. Um, and uh, I had to go to Japan, I had to go to Canada to learn how to fly the robotic arm. Oh, I had to nice. go to Europe wow. to learn their module. So there's a lot of things. Oh, and by the way, I had to learn Russian language. I saw that. Um, wow. And I was the crew medical officer. So I had to learn a lot of medicals. I worked at the Houston uh, Medical Center for a week. Okay. In the emergency room and yep. the operating room. And, and, and I did went to the UT dental school to learn how to pull teeth. And I did the first ever filling in space. So oh, really? it's a great job for nice. an ADD person. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you claim the ADD as well? Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm kind of that guy as sure. well. <laughs> sure. So maybe I can be an astronaut. Am I too old for that? <laughs> I tell you what, the good news is if, if you got 250 grand, you're not too old. So um, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin are both going to be flying space tourists maybe this year. I think it's, we've been saying this for a while, but I, I do think it's going to be in the near future. Yeah. You cool. can pay for a ticket and go up. It'll I just think be a little quick five minute, you go up and come right back down. But you'll be in space, you'll be floating, you'll see the blackness of space and the curvature of the earth. That'll be a pretty cool experience. Yeah. I think I'm going to be a little short on the funds. I think I'll watch, I'll, I'll, I'll see the, <laughs> their videos and travel pics <laughs> instead. Once, once space tourism comes back, you can do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to pull up a clip. Now, bear with me. I got to get the studio engineer doing this. So. Eight, seven, six, five. We have to go for ready to start. Two, one, zero. Booster ignition and liftoff of Shuttle Endeavour with NASA's final space station crew compartment that brings a bay window view to our celestial backyard. flight to the International Space Station. 28 seconds into the flight, Endeavour flying at 1,100 miles per hour, 1.3 miles in altitude, and 7 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, according to onboard computers. Endeavour's engines are throttling down at the, as the orbiter passes through the area of maximum. Wow, okay, so... You know, I grew I, up. I remember that. Yeah, I'll bet. I bet it's something you never forgot. <laughs> I grew up driving muscle cars and uh, and riding sport bikes, and I was pretty much into the the rush of speed. But tell us a little bit about uh, what's that experience like riding rockets. Um, that's the name of a book by a fellow astronaut, Mike Mullane. Uh, mm. He he was probably twenty years before my time. Uh, his son is like my age. But um, I, I had been a test pilot and a fighter pilot. So I thought I'd, I had a Yamaha 80cc Mike, uh, dirt bike when I was eight. Um, so I like speed too. And I thought I had done a lot. And mm -hmm. then on the shuttle, the engines light up six seconds before liftoff. And I heard this roar and I thought, 
oh shit, <laughs> this is <laughs> something serious is about to happen. And What's then happening? the solid rocket boosters lit off, <laughs> and nighttime turned to day. Why the Google? Not right now, but just Google STS one thirty launch videos, and people posted their home videos. Uh, you know, back in the day, a point. It was ten years ago, so there was no iPhone cameras, but there was point and shoot cameras. There, it's dark. Everybody's cheering. You see the little engines light up mm -hmm. for a few seconds, and then when the solids light up, boom! The whole nighttime turns to day because wow. there was a thin layer of clouds about right. five thousand feet so above us, reflecting and off the rocket that. flames reflected off the clouds, and and it was so loud, and it's like somebody grabbing you, shaking you as hard as they can, and you're instantly smashed back. So you're in a four million pound bomb and the acceleration is so much that you get thrown back all G's right off the launch pad um, and that Billy G's so it's like laying on your back with a couple of your buddies laying on top of you um, How many so it, it's an amazing experience wow. the whole chapter one of my first book and then a few chapters in How to Astronaut were about that eight and a half minute ride into space uh, it was just experience after experience after experience wow Gave me goosebumps. <laughs> I want to go. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. You should try it. I highly recommend it. Once uh, tourism starts, you'll, and the money starts flowing, you'll, you'll be able to save it. <laughs> well, after all the years of training, did you find any surprises in your first mission to space? N nonstop surprises. Um, I <laughs> thought I knew everything. Same. I had read all the books. I had been in an astronaut office full of astronauts for 10 years, and I'm very curious. I would talk to people all the time. What's right. it like? The, the first view I had flying over the North Atlantic, we launched at four in the morning, and so we're flying into the first sunrise. And it's like that. There's this blue, before the yeah. orange, you know, five minutes before sunrise, there's this blue line, the mm -hmm. only blue, no orange. And um, I thought, my God, I've never seen that shade of blue before. It was really mind blowing. Mm -hmm. And the shuttle had probably a thousand or thousands of pounds of liquid oxygen and hydrogen frozen kind of leaking out the engines as the engine went through the shutdown sequence. And so there's all this ice of oxygen and hydrogen ice and, f and it was flying past the, the windows. Mm -hmm. These okay. thousands of little like fireflies out right. there in, with the sun shining on it, but we're still in nighttime over the earth. Amazing. And th there's this, this cloud of, sparkling ice flying around us as I'm going into the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life, this blue sunrise. And I had to fly the shuttle. So yeah. I'm like, I just wanted to look and go, yes, this is amazing, but I got to fly the shuttle because we're about to maneuver. Keep so. your eyes on the it road. Was, uh, <laughs> yeah. It was like that. For, yeah. For over of what I did was just boring and well, this mundane work. And then 1% was like sublime, you know, you're yeah. seeing God. Awesome. And then you had to get back. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it, it struck me what you says, like you thought you knew everything after all the years of training. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, it's kind of like the same with me in Everest. Like we had intensive training for three years and nonstop training. And then we thought we knew everything. But when we got there and we really dealt with the real thing, like the mountains, like, whew, like everything's like I forgot how to tie a knot it's like i was just so amazed and how powerful <laughs> the environment is like who yeah so I, I i get you i hear you when you say like oh, i thought i knew it all <laughs> but yeah adapting to yeah. microgravity moving eating drinking blood circulation what's all uh, like that in uh, in space um it's a whole experience again <laughs> I, i've written a lot about it in both my books the uh uh, the, the first thing is it doesn't stop. So on Earth, you can be weightless for a second if you jump off a diving board. Mm -hmm. um, if you go in the Vomit Comet airplane, I write about that. You know, the pilot pushes Love forward, it. and as the plane does this, you get 20 <laughs> seconds of weightlessness. But in space, mm. it doesn't stop. Right. And the first couple days, man, my brain was not happy. It didn't know what was happening. I could I could only move fast, so if you need to turn around, if I, I could have done that, and I would have thrown up right away. Really? Um, wow. And I just had a raging headache. Uh, like, I really had a bad headache for two days. Um, and then it was like a light switch flipped on the morning of my third day in space. My crewmate, Steve Robinson, asked me, how are you feeling? I was like, I feel like crap. And then right after that, all of a sudden, I felt fine. And when I went back four or five years later on my second flight, 
I felt fine. My the neurons had been rewired and they just remembered space and it wasn't a problem at all. All right. It's um, kind of like so uh, that was really interesting. Kind of like altitude training. Yeah. You sort of but remember. We have it. something. Right. We, so we have something called we call it space brain. It's basically the weightlessness is probably disorienting and your brain is spending a lot of effort trying to figure out what's going on as opposed to normal mental yeah. calculation to do. And also there's a lot of carbon dioxide in space, so a lot more than there is on Earth. And that kind of impedes your brain function and makes you crabby. And, you know, it's not awful, but astronauts really are, you know, they, you kind of lose a few points of IQ just by going into space. And everybody knows that everybody's aware of that. Um, and I would imagine it's a similar problem on Everest where you're yeah. hypoxic mm -hmm. and you're frozen. And, you know, the probably the most dangerous thing there from what I've heard is, is just your judgment. I mean, I can, I can hear you. I can, I'm back. We, we dropped off for a second. Yeah. 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 Well, yes, you were saying Everest. And, and yes, it's true. I, I, I lost a few brain cells. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sharp as before. I, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's a I different a... reason. Yeah. You're, right. you're hypoxic and we're floating and yeah. carbon dioxide, but it's the same same end result your your brain slows down a little bit oxygen yeah sure. deprived yeah uh years ago i yeah. teamed up with the oh, real, real quick I, yeah. go ahead sure. i have an everest story all right let's do it so my colleague scott karazinski good friend of mine um has been to everest twice he the first time they had to turn back and the second time he summited um he also ran the medical the u.s antarctic program so he was like the head doctor down there and uh, he flew in space five times on the space shuttle. He's one of these underachievers. Mm -hmm. So when, when we installed the cupola, they, we had this plaque that had a moon rock from the Apollo program, and it had a rock that he had gotten from Everest. Oh, and so yeah. it, on the ISS up in outer space, there was a rock from the moon and a rock <laughs> from Mount Everest. Cool. Really cool. That is so right cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I sort of I, I want to tell you the story. Years ago, I... Uh, I teamed up with uh, Olaf Zipser to produce a film called Atmosphere Dolphin. Are you familiar with Olaf? O Olaf from uh, Disney? No. And Olaf Zipser. He's a uh, he's Olaf's oh. like the the king of skydiving, or like the Michael Jordan oh. of the sport, so to speak. Right. Right. Anyway, years ago, he and I uh, we did a film called Atmosphere Dolphin, and I got to know him pretty well, and. He used to tell me about one of his dreams, and it was one of his dreams was to teach astronauts to fly in from the space station. He was talking about developing a wingsuit, a special wingsuit that could handle the environment, so the astronauts could fly in from space, saving heaps of money and reentry. Is this feasible? It's funny you say that. Um, so I'm a, a brand ambassador for Watch Company, and uh, one of my fellow, I, I, one of the, my fellow Omega guys has a company that is actually trying to do that exact thing where you have um, a, a big heat shield. The problem is not the wing, the problem is the heat shield. Because yeah. uh, when you're asked, um, you know, you, you, you got know, 400 on the trying front. to develop that exact kind of thing. Now, right. yeah, to get it from orbit where you're going Mach 25 would be, you'd need a spaceship. But to do like the Virgin Galactic, where you're only going Mach 5 and then re enter, like that would be pretty cool to launch in the Virgin Galactic spaceship mm -hmm. and then like jettison like a bomb and have the, a person come back to Earth. I think that would be a really cool thing. It's feasible. It's feasible, okay. But not from the, but not from the space engineering station. Engineering development. Yeah. Okay. And you need a crazy guy to be willing to do that. Well, Olaf's your man. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so he taught skydiving. He's still teaching today, but uh, you know, almost everybody that he gets involved with becomes a world champion. And he developed what's called the Olaf position, which is you see it now. It's quite common. It's the head to earth position. So, but anyway. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I did a film with him called Atmosphere Dolphin. It was really cool. Years ago, I was pretty young, but really cool stuff. I love skydiving. I want to get my license. I. When I was a cadet at the academy, I, I did uh, skydiving with the French Air Force. And uh, I jumped out. It was static line, so 1,200 feet, you know, Army parachute kind of thing. Mm. And um, I, I was the last man out. And then I was looking down, and the, there, I was 
their parachute jump. What's happening? <laughs> and anyway, then I was on crutches for a few weeks. Something was wrong with my parachute. Oh. Um, was that was that so the big that was round my shoot? Only or... skydiving until. Right. What's that? Was that the the typical like uh, airborne uh, shoot, the round shoot yeah. that drops it, really fast? Yeah, it was a round shoot. Yeah. Uh, army. Parachute. Those things yeah. are dangerous. <laughs> Uh, but it's you know it's the military and and, mm. and the the way they were teaching us was very different from the way the Americans taught they they were like you have to watch the whole time I only did like a couple of practice they have a little simulated airplane you jump out of it and you hit the ground two feet below your you know to do your PLF your parachute yeah. landing fall right and um, the Americans taught you to just watch the horizon and don't anticipate and feet knees butt was the that's how you're supposed to fall, feet, knees, mm-hmm. butt. Mm-hmm. Stay around the horizon and don't anticipate Hit it, but the ground and know what you're doing. It was exactly the opposite. Yeah. So instead of feet, knees, butt, it was um, feet, mouth. <laughs> but <laughs> my, my tooth basically turned, died, and I had like this brown, dead tooth. Where, you know, I, I wedged it for years. Um, so then I took my son, son skydive free fall for his 18th birthday. Cool. Oh. And it was the cool. The only problem was it was tandem. I was with another guy, and I want to go just do that on my own. It was awesome. I loved it. Yeah, I, my, I did that course as well, but I'm not going to tell him. I sort of won't tell that story. I'll probably get in trouble. I actually told him I had done my tandem. You know, you're required to do a tandem first. All my buddies right. were in uh, Rangers and, you know, Special right. Forces and stuff, and a lot of them were Halo qualified. And right. they were pumping me, like, dude, you got to do it. So... When I go to the school there, they go, okay, have you done, ta- oh yeah, I did a tandem. I lied, totally right. lied just to get through that section. <laughs> but then, you know, the worst part, Terry, was that when when I'm in the plane, I'm going to jump, I go, shit, man, I should have never lied. What the hell? I, I don't know what I'm going to do. He goes, remember when you reached up and you grabbed the toggle and you pulled left or right? I was like, oh, I don't remember that part. <laughs> so... <laughs> Anyway, and then you got to know when to flare with the square. Totally. Yeah. Anyway, I got it together and pulled it all off. But don't tell that story. Yeah, you're still That's here. Awesome. <laughs> and then when you you're in your arch and you have to you have to reach, but if you just do this, right, you spin. I'm like, right, you got to do this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Look, reach, yeah. pull. Right. Yeah. yeah great yeah, stuff. I, 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 I love need it. To get my license. I've been too busy the last couple of years with traveling and writing and doing all this stuff, but. Um, I need to get back to flying. I haven't been flying as a pilot, and I need to get my skydiving license. So yeah, I saw you. Bucket in, list is long. You're in <laughs> Dubai a lot, and you got a really cool place there. Uh, uh, skydive Dubai. It's got some pretty good instructors, so it's a pretty good yeah, spot. We, There's some good places have, in Texas. We considered that. I, yeah. I was there a few months ago, um, and we one weekend we were. It was either go scuba diving or skydiving. We were trying to decide. Mm. Um, okay, yeah. next time. <laughs> Yeah, so here's another thing. I, I became a, an ROV pilot uh, a few years back, about eight years ago. I got my ROV, underwater ROV. And right. recently I came across the uh, Astro B. And I was curious, do you have anything that goes outside the spaceship and can do the work that you do like on spacewalks now? Right. So when I was there, there was this thing called um, Robonaut, which mm. is this big, creepy, 10-foot-tall robot. It's <laughs> It's kind of cool, sort mm-hmm. of, but it could be in a horror film, too. Right. <laughs> and uh, my, my first experiment on my first day there was to work on Robonaut, and it didn't work, and it took me hours, and I was I felt so badly, like I screwed it up, but it turns out it was just broken. So we were <laughs> testing it, but the goal was to let it go outside, and it can't do fine motor skills, but it could, like, move the equipment and or get things ready for you, whatever. It could do some work, uh, but Na- NASA canceled it. The budget got cut, so... Uh, I have said, hey, we should have these little uh, robots that fly around, little drones that yeah. fly and do work. I mean, all that stuff would be possible. It's just money. And uh, mm. so the short answer is no. The long answer is it could happen. And I think that would be cool. But, you know, we don't have anything right now that does it. Yeah, I'm guessing because, you know, oil and gas has got so much money in ROV now. And it's really yeah. taken off in the last few years. And so yeah. I see that's probably coming in the future for sure. Yeah. yeah. A lot of automation is coming in all fields. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's going to kind of change human society in the next few decades, I think. Yeah, we got a yeah. question about that coming up shortly. Um, yeah. Well, you're a retired astronaut, Terry, but you're still young. Do you want to go back to space? 
Um, so when you leave NASA, that's a one-way door, right? You don't go uh... back to NASA. But, and I was ready. I was still young. I, I wanted to do film and books and, you know, there's other things I wanted to do in life because I could have stuck around NASA and then maybe done the same exact thing five years later, but I, I wanted to do this other stuff. Okay. But, um, you know, there's private companies, who knows? Uh, the, I, I always said I would, if I could film, make a film, I, I, I'd consider going back. Um, I love what I'm doing now. I'm super busy, so. Mm -hmm. That's good. I, I, who knows? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't long, long for it. I'm seven months, you know, I check the box, but um, uh, the space is pretty cool. It's a powerful drug. A lot of my I'll colleagues bet. just, they land and they get back in line and they land and they get back in line. <laughs> it, it's, it, you know, some folks have a hard time giving it up. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so on a national level, there's a new space race brewing, control of near earth, space domain, space resources, leading actors being China and the U.S. What's your view on this? Um, so, sounds like you're reading a press release. <laughs> <laughs> um, space is super important. It's, we wouldn't be talking right now if it weren't for space, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it affects all aspects of our lives on a daily basis. And so it's really important that that remain free and open and unhindered. It's kind of like freedom of navigation of the seas. You know, you don't want pirates and yeah. making boats not able to try, or you don't want, you know, people shooting down air. Yeah, so the seaways of space to be hindered. Yeah. So it's really important. Um, we've had a space force since the 60s. The military has had a bigger budget than NASA ever since Apollo. Uh, the, you know, the old Air Force Space Command was about twice the size. Of, it was bigger than NASA. And so um, they've recently reorganized that under Space Force, which I actually wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post a couple years ago. I think it makes a lot of sense because space is not air, land, or sea. It's a very different place. The things that you operate in space with are very different than airplanes, boats, and tanks. Um, I, I, I actually think we should have a cyber force also because cyber is super important. You know, we just had this massive attack by the Russians. They had, they attacked a, a lot of our government. Um, so cyber Russians. is really important too. And cyber is not air, land, or sea. And it's also not space. Mm. So I think it's important to let people work. We call it organized, train, and equip in the DOD and the military. So I think organized, train, and equip makes a lot of sense by domain. That's why, you know, we won World War II with an army, our Army Air Force, but that didn't really make sense. And so it made sense to have an Air Force, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just because the air is not the ground. And in the same way, space and cyber are not air, land, or sea. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, space resources, well, mining of asteroids, space solar yeah. power, uh, technologies that can take the strain of our overuse of Earth's resources. Um, in 2021, China is planning to catch a 10-meter asteroid and bring it down to Earth. China also already, already built the first infrastructures to receive energy from space solar power. How soon do you think this will happen? Um, space solar power is interesting. I've, I've actually was talking yesterday with the National Space Society. They're a big um, proponent of that. Uh, you know, the sun's energy is limitless, um, and you can transmit that via microwave radiation. Um, on places like the moon, you could use lasers because there's no atmosphere. You could use lasers on Earth, but um, the atmosphere really attenuates the energy, so microwave might be better. Plus, the laser beam, you wouldn't want to accidentally walk through that laser beam. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's otherwise known as a weapon. Mm -hmm. So it, it's an interesting idea. The problem is with all of this energy going through the atmosphere, you don't want to fly through it. Mm. You know, how is it going to affect? So yeah, this would birds? have to be. A... Is it going to affect weather? Yeah, but it's an it's interesting and it, it's it's infinite. We're never going to run out of so, solar energy. Right. So that I think that is an interesting um, way to do things, and it could it could you know it could definitely happen. Uh, mining asteroids is an interesting idea. It all comes down to launch cost. And, um, to get to a place like an asteroid and bring it back to Earth, I'm I haven't done the math in detail, but it would be hundreds of thousands of dollars a pound. So you'd have to be mining something that's got some worth value. hundreds of thousands of dollars a pound or more to make mm -hmm. it worth it. And there are some things that we don't have on Earth. So sure. there are some materials out there in space 
that, you know, might Could, be worth that. Yeah. Um, are we going to bring that cost down by an order of magnitude? Can it be tens of thousands of dollars a pound? I don't think so. I don't think launch is going to get that cheap anytime soon. But if it did, that would open up a lot more materials to make it interesting economically. Um, another technology I think is space manufacturing. I'm actually working with a startup. Um, some SpaceX alumni did a startup for space manufacturing, mm -hmm. and they have some really compelling business cases for manufacturing materials in space. Um, so we'll see where they where that goes, but um, it's a it's a that's another part of the space economy that hopefully will get opened up. Yeah, so this is still on the same topic, space resources, quantum computing in space, 3D mm -hmm. printing in space. What, mm -hmm. what, what's the future? What technologies will really have impact in the next 20 years? Um, my core crew actually did the first ever 3D printed uh, item in space. We, we made a wrench, um, oh, and that right. was like the first, made in space, yeah, the first ever nice. 3D uh, printed thing. That is really interesting because... Because, you know, on a mission to Mars, you don't, you, if you have to bring every possible spare part, mm. that's a lot of stuff. So if you could 3D print some stuff, that would be, um, so I think that's a technology, especially for human spaceflight, that could be really good. You could use that same technology to manufacture things, space, and then bring them back to Earth. Because when you make things in weightlessness, their material properties can be really interesting. Um, so I think that is definitely a technology for the future of space travel. Okay. Yeah. So we have some friends, uh, Tom and Tina, at uh, Python Space, and they're building a space system to go to Mars. Mm -hmm. This space system is light and fast, and uh, it's kind of like, you know, Eds Edsmond when he went to the South Pole. Uh, and then on the other hand, you've got Elon Musk, who's building a starship for hundreds of people to go to Mars. So we got a full-blown expedition-style approach, and we've got what you would call like an alpine-style approach. How would you plan and design an expedition to Mars? Um, yeah, so the, there was a great headline yesterday. Uh, Elon's Starship launches, maneuvers in space, and, and lands. It was like such a matter-of-fact headline for the, their Starship. Um, <laughs> the big thing for me for Mars is time. A normal rocket with chemical engines like Elon Starship or mm -hmm. almost every other rocket that we use, you burn an oxidizer and a fuel, it takes three years. It's, it's a six to nine months to get there. The yeah. Earth and Mars are going around the sun, so you got to wait until they align again. And then it's six to nine months to come back. It's a three-year total mission. Wow. You can do that with something called nuclear thermal propulsion, mm -hmm. which instead of burning a fuel, you take a, a piece of uranium you heat up the propellant just because it's hot, and right. that, shoot, that shoots it out the back of the nozzle. Um, it's still a three-year, two-and-a-half, three-year. It's a long mission. It can be cheaper because the nuclear rocket's more efficient. Mm -hmm. Nuclear thermal rocket is more efficient, but it's still slow. If you did a like a nuclear power plant that generated megawatts of electricity, you could do something called uh, electric propulsion, which we use all the time on satellites on really small scale. You know, the engines are this size, they're small. But if you had megawatts of electricity and made the engine really big, you could go so fast that you could get there, spend a month on the surface and come back in one year. You don't wow. have, you, you, you would get there like this, Okay. right? You, would, you wouldn't have to wait till they go around the sun twice. Um, so uh, anyway, that, that for me, that's the most important thing because at hundreds of thousands of dollars a pound or at a million dollars a pound, um, which ends up being a pretty big, there's a lot of zeros in that cost. Okay. And cutting it down to one year, hopefully could bring that cost down. And it's, it's one year aviation versus three years of getting exposed to radiation. Mm -hmm. um, now you do have a nuclear power plant, so you have to deal with that radiation, but there's a lot of trade-offs. But I think versus three years is Uh oh, you there? I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, okay. You said lost yes, it for a yes, second. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. So. There's a lot of trade offs in there. Yes. Let's get into the paranormal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, this is an interesting uh, topic for 
I think everybody. Everybody loves this one. <laughs> Have you had any UFO encounters during your career? So, um, <clears throat> personally, I have not. Um, there's there's a funny video on YouTube talking a UFO because I'm doing a spacewalk and there's like a flash, and then my hand goes to where the flash was, mm -hmm. um, and the guy and the narrator's like, "And there, astronaut Terry Virts, and there." He's blocking the view of the of the oh, UFO right. and blah blah blah. And They're going like, to cut the feed. Like, I knew exactly where the UFO was. I knew exactly where to put my finger, and the other ten cameras on the ISS aren't going to see it. Like it's just so ridiculous how right. these people say these things. Um, so no, personally, I didn't see anything. Although I will say that that these Navy videos that they, have been coming out are really interesting, and I think there's something there. I mean, like that that is not normal. What Fravor and the other yeah Navy so this pilots. is uh commander Fravor. he's talking about the tic tac yeah. uh ufo yeah that's yeah. dave Fravor, i think right or something yeah yeah what's so they've got f-18 hud videos so, yeah yeah it's incredible I, that was one of the questions we we're going to ask you getting into the bit of the paranormal because that's an incredible story it's well documented yeah. and uh <coughs> yeah what do you what do you think is going on there what what's your thoughts I mean, you know, between the Navy radars that were tracking this thing, the the F-18, the Hornet infrared camera was tracking it. Um, there was a pilots in Oregon. A few were also making a similar sighting and <clears throat> some other Navy guys off the East Coast. This this was in San Diego, the big famous incident. Right. Yeah. But there were some sightings off the East Coast, too, near Norfolk. Um, I don't know. That thing went up and down quicker than things that normally go up and down and you know I, I i don't know what it was yeah um, it's bizarre i talked to a former uh, under secretary of defense this guy's pretty legitimate you know high level official and he's had an office to investigate um you know so it, it, it clearly raised legitimate people's security eyebrows, like what's going threats, on here right? it's been on cnn and new york times mm. my first instinct is always to say it's not an, like it's not an alien is always the first answer Okay. Um, whatever weird thing you see, it's not an alien. There's got to be some explanation, but whatever explanation for this thing is going to be pretty crazy. You know, either somebody's got some crazy technology or who knows what. But um, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and also the Wilmea Mea, whatever I pronounce that, the the object that came flying through our solar system a few years ago. Okay. Yeah. And this, um, it's a it's a really famous, yeah that, that's well it's yeah thing. that's it's a Hawaiian name right it's and, like what well, may I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right but yeah and um, yeah the the and, direct how it came into our universe and and then how it left it just defied the laws of physics something like well that. it was moving it was moving so fast that it didn't come from our solar system so it came from another star uh, and I think that was the first time first we ever time. tracked an object moving that fast. And um, uh, my understanding, I'm not an astronomer, but listening to them, it had an aspect ratio, I think of 11 to one, where it was it was a cigar, not a baseball. Right, right. right. And so things that, as far as we know, aren't shaped like that. Hmm. Um, and the other really bizarre thing was it accelerated. Yes. Like, not only did it move fast, but vroom, it, <laughs> yeah. it sped up. Mm -hmm. um, and things don't speed up unless they're comets. Comets have ice, Which... and when the tails go on that way, it's comets moving in the opposite direction, right? It's just F equals MA, it's Isaac Newton physics. It's how rockets work. Right. But the astronomers specifically look for ice debris or any type of trail exhaust, and they couldn't find anything. So this thing came in from another star for the first time ever that we've seen that. Um, it was, accelerating mm -hmm. uh, and it was a shape that as far as we know can't exist in the in the universe now mm -hmm. astronomers have come up with theories of how that shape could exist and you know there's there like are could be a wing potential expert my favorite um, science fiction book i wrote a i used to write a blog and i stopped that now i write books and okay and, and movies instead but that um one of them was about science fiction books my favorite my favorite science fiction book of all time was rendezvous with rama by Arthur Clarke. And that was a cylinder that came flying through the solar system. 
you know, it was, it was rotating to give it an artificial gravity. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyways, we're really, it was basically like what he described happened. this thing yeah. in this yeah. book back in the 1960s or 70s, whenever, whenever that book came out. Wow. Cool stuff. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pull up another clip. Yeah. Hold, hang tight for a second. Yeah, the, the, this clip. Aliens exist and President Trump knows about it. That's a Hi, Alison. Well, this is quite a story, and it comes from the man who headed Israel's space security program for nearly 30 years. Chaim Eshed is making the extraordinary claim that the United States and Israel have been in contact with a group of aliens for years, not immigrants, but extraterrestrials. He has called them the Galactic Federation. The good news is that he claims an agreement has been reached between the US government and the aliens, a contract to do experiments here. There's also, he says, a secret underground base on Mars where there are American and alien representatives. Oh, <laughs> my screen just started. There yeah. we go. Terry, now, okay, I want you to be completely honest with us. Do you know anything about this? Yeah, I, I remember seeing the headline with that. <laughs> but here's my thing on that. So, you remember the 90s? We were all around in the 90s. Yeah. And there there was this guy named Bill Clinton, right? Mm -hmm. And he had an intern named Monica Lewinsky. And he could not keep that incident under wraps, right? Mm -hmm. So, if, like, one person can't hide that secret, how is the government hiding the secret? secret amongst thousands of people about aliens right people say we didn't land on the moon and i'm like there are 400,000 people working in apollo is the government really that good that they all stayed quiet for 50 years you know yeah. um and i never really thought i remember seeing the israeli guy claims that there's aliens i'm like you know i doubt it this is a crazy what, story man now i know it's not true because now i know it's not true because he said we have a base on mars and how do we have a base on Mars? Like people would have noticed the massive rocketing. Sure. The Russians would have noticed the massive rocket launching. The Chinese would have noticed the ma and this there's a army of nerds that track satellites and you you can just go online. Of course, the Air Force and now Space Force tracks satellites. And it's probably harder to get their data, but there's in private individuals that track things and they post it online and stuff. So if we had a base on Mars, for, where did the $100 billion go out of the federal budget? And mm. where did the rocket launch from? And where is the tracking data? So we don't have that. And that tells me that that guy's full of it. Well, there could be the argument that they're riding up mm. in the Tic Tac. <laughs> there could job. be that argument, right? <laughs> yeah. To anyway. develop that technology would be a pretty, that, you know, there, there are black programs that are good at hiding sure. money in the federal budget. But you would have to hide, you know, the Navy in the federal budget in order to make something that big. <laughs> yeah. Which would be hard to do. Yeah. I came across that the other day and I was just flabbergasted. I was like, is, is this real? I couldn't even believe that this guy is saying it, especially uh, coming from his background. So it's a crazy story. So I, you know, here's a big thing. This is super important. We have to have some wisdom and discernment because there probably are aliens. I mean, there's billions of planets out there. There, you know, there's a good chance that there's aliens. Um, personally, I think the what, from what I know as a scientist about life, it's so complicated. I think somebody has to start it. I don't think it would just happen on its own. Right. Um, and I'm not saying that from a religious point of view. I'm saying it from a scientific point of sure. view. Sure. But anyway, if there's aliens or not, those stars are really, 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 really far away. Mm -hmm. And so, and to hear a signal from a another civilization, whatever star they're next to is a lot louder than they are, right? So the signal to noise ratio from some alien TV shows would be drowned out by the alien star next, right. next to them. So, you, you know, Virtually the impossible. odds of yeah. us ever having contact with them, if they came here, they would be so far advanced than what we can even imagine. Um, yeah. And they always go to Roswell, New Mexico. Like, if I came to Earth, I'd go to the Bahamas <laughs> or I'd go to the Himalayas or something. I'd yeah. go to the Philippines before right. I went to Roswell. Yeah. I love Roswell, by the way. I love New Mexico, but <laughs> yeah, you know what too. I'm saying. So yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there and they're kind of fun unless they turn into a riot at the Capitol. 
right? We kind of have to tone down the rhetoric on some of the more crazy things. It's yeah. fine. There might be aliens. I'm not saying there's not. I'm sure. saying we ought to investigate the Tic Tacs. But I'm also saying, all right, let's 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 have some common sense here and bring things under control, too. Right. Yeah. I agree. But interesting stuff. Everybody really gets into the alien story. Yes, of course. Everybody loves aliens. Of yeah. course. Everybody <laughs> loves aliens. Hey, so I'm going to we're going to get into uh, the next section. And, you know, I kind of want to apologize. It's li- we're going to have some hard questions a little bit here bit about current events but uh sure. these are things that are affecting all of us right now and you have uh, such a scientific background i thought you might have some good insights or perspectives so so for example covid19 presented employers with a choice basically to uh either find ways where workers do their jobs safely or shut down google and nasa achieved quantum supremacy ai is learning from office workers and cloud data from around the world Automated systems can detect indif- insufficiencies and human manager that human managers cannot detect. Millions have lost their job in the pandemic, and robots and AR replace them faster than ever. Do you think robots will replace humans as motorized vehicles ousted horses? So, yeah, we talked about this earlier. I think this is one of the biggest threats facing humanity. Um, and there, I, I read an interesting article last year about what nations are most at risk from automation Um, and China is pretty high up there because they have such a manual labor economy America is actually not too bad like 30% of our workers were at risk from automation whereas China Mm -hmm. was like 70% Mm -hmm. and those numbers are society destabilizing numbers you know if if 70% of of China loses their job the world is going to have a major event after something like that happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we really need to be smart about how we manage automation. Um, in general, I'm a fan of free trade, and in general, I'm a fan of efficiency. It, it's better to have a John Deere than a hundred guys, uh, you know, uh, vegetables from a field. Um, but there's a real risk to losing your job, and and you can't just be in, you can't just be the heartless capitalist that doesn't care because eventually that will lead to a revolution and revolutions are not good things. They don't end well. Um, so we need to figure out how to keep things reasonably moderate, you know, respect humans while we let robots make our lives more efficient. But, you know, the Terminator, um, I'm, I'm friends with Jim Cameron and hmm. I, Terminator, especially Terminator 2 is one of the best movies ever. I love Terminator 2. But in his vision, they were the, they were, humanoids that came to shoot us with with guns mm-hmm. um that's not the ra- the robot future that i fear the robot future i fear is this ai yeah that can knows everything that we're doing um automate so wait um and the algorithms that come with that have destabilized america right if you i don't know if you've seen the social dilemma uh, it's a great documentary oh um, yeah i did see yeah. that yeah that's yeah. uh that's there's a and that's exactly what I'm talking about. When you think about yeah. how they're using our data, and yeah. and now they're they're taking like let's just call it office workers working in the Philippines who are in call centers. They're recording all right. of that. They're pumping it into of the course. cloud. The AI is learning it. I mean, there's so much information being pumped into AI to teach it to do the things that we commonly do, and that's moving a lot faster now with with that's- COVID-19. On top of that, you can make deep fake videos. Um, yeah. There's a great deep fake video of Richard Nixon reading his speech. There, um, uh, Bill Sapphire wrote a speech for Nixon to read in case in case of moon disaster, if the Apollo guys couldn't launch and they were stuck on the moon. It's a beautiful speech. It makes the hair stand up. Uh, uh, history, fate has determined that the men who went to the moon to explore in peace shall, shall remain there and to rest in peace. It's an amazing speech. He never gave it, thank God. There's a deep fake video of Richard Nixon reading that speech, and it, it's real. Wow. You can't tell. Yeah. So just imagine if, you know, in, in Jim Cameron's world, um, you know, the, ro- the, the robots become self aware and they take over the B 2 bombers and they nuke us all and they shoot us with laser guns. That's not how it's going to happen. <laughs> the computers becoming self-aware through AI, which is intelligence, yeah. mm-hmm. that's that's a much more dangerous thing. And the government that we have 
around the world, they're either authorit authoritarian governments, which are really bad, or, you know, the American government's been dysfunctional for over 20 years where the Republicans and Democrats don't get along. They're, we're about to pass a $2 trillion almost. Yeah. $2 trillion. That's yeah. almost the whole What's size going of on? the federal budget. <laughs> Where's it coming from, man? 50 to 50. Well, oh, no, it, God. Yeah, exactly. We're just going to no double it. Consensus. We're passing it 50 to 50, a $2 trillion budget. How's so that possible? That, that dysfunctional body is incapable of legislating such a complicated subject, mm. right? And when Twitter and Facebook are allowed to run these algorithms, really, really good at grabbing our attention. I've been stuck on this one video game on my <laughs> iPhone playing it. Um, they're really good at, at getting our attention, at shaping our opinions, at radicalizing Americans, you know? And whatever you believe in is going to be reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. And people are becoming radical or become radical on the left and they're they're losing, you know, wisdom and discernment of really important because they they're threatening our democracy. And if there's no American democracy, if it doesn't function well, there are other options that are not good options, you know. Um, there's plenty of authoritarian options and so this idea of AI, this idea of social media algorithms, this idea of automation, those are all things that can destabilize us in different ways. And it's kind of like this perfect storm that's coming. Um, and it's not, you know, the that story still needs to be, we need to make sure we write the pro proper ending to that, I think. Yeah, I, I want to go there as well. I want to say, so in retrospect, like the current events, big tech now effectively decides who has the right to speak, who has the right to assemble online, and who has the ability to build a business in a in the digital age? Does this does this strike fear in you at all, or make you think twice about voicing your true opinions in today's sort of gig economy? So yes, yeah, so there's this idea of the woke. Uh, yeah, right. You know, cancel culture. Cancel culture. It's a very real thing. I just read a while. Right. Um, but if you do, then you're done. Um, I've been speaking out against China because a good friend of mine, a journalist there was captured as part of this split. They're trying to get back at Australia. She's an Australian citizen. She's been charged. She's disappeared from life. Can't talk to anybody. They mm. wiped her off the internet. It's 19. And so I have spoken out against China. A lot of my colleagues would never dream of that because you can't do business in China. Right. Um, in Hollywood, and I want to get into Hollywood. I want to direct feature films. I want to mm -hmm. do film and TV. If you say something that's not ideologically pure, you're blacklisted forever. It and can go so bad China, direction for you. Hollywood is really trying to do mo the Chinese movie market is huge. Mm -hmm. If you've noticed, there's been some films re recently that were these films. The Meg about the big shark uh, was a Chinese film. Mm -hmm. um, it was right where you are, the, the island. Um, the Chinese, uh, I, I did a speech there, uh, like the tourist island off the south okay. part of China. Yeah, yeah. To Bataha? No. Uh, anyway, so you can't criticize China. A friend of mine, Daryl Morey, who's the general manager of the Houston Rockets, he said, hey, we need to stand with Hong Kong. And there was, was a anti-NBA backlash. The whole NBA had cold water thrown on it. No that. one has spoken a word against China since then. Um, the NBA's lost billions of dollars. You know, China was a big market for them, and they stopped showing yeah, NBA they games. Shut it they down. still won't show Houston Rockets games. Those are real bottom line dollars. So if you want to stand up for what's right, that's going to cost you, it might cost your organization millions or more dollars. And Americans are, are effectively, so you, can, you can complain about America. And you can say how bad we are, kneel for the national anthem and mm -hmm. police brutality and America's evil all day long. But if you, you can't say anything against China, if you work in the business community or even Hollywood, because um, you just can't. Yeah, right. Yeah, so this is it's interesting uh, where this is going in this cancel culture uh, and, and the power that, that it has. I, I, it's I, not what, healthy at all. Not healthy at all. And I think, like, for example, uh, when we're talking about COVID and stuff, we have a lot of... Uh, people are being canceled like some of the top brass in the medical field are speaking up about their professional beliefs on some of the COVID issues and you know Facebook and YouTube can pretty much cancel them 
And so my thought is, yeah. is this, yeah. how dangerous is this like <clears throat> t to our science when people will be scared to speak right. their opinions, their truths or what they believe is true? It's going to corrupt our science, yeah. I think, and people are going to start bending. It, it, it will, yeah. The yeah. Twitter mob will just attack you, and so you have to be willing to not care about the Twitter mob, which is hard to do it sometimes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> to your point about how much power Facebook has, this is not our first rodeo. This has happened in America before, where the railroads were a monopoly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, AT&T was a monopoly, Microsoft. There's been these big government versus... Uh, antitrust cases and I think the time has come for big tech they're something they're gonna just have to way change. too powerful yeah. if you've been following what's happening in Australia it's really interesting yeah I, I don't really know that um, story I did see how they they, they weren't allowing yeah. them with the news but I, I don't really know that story too well if, if you just think about it um, the press has been decimated the last 10 or 20 years has not sure. been kind to of the press and that's really bad like we need a functioning First Amendment press in order to have a democracy. A democracy, that yeah. Russia and China, you know, newspapers have really been hurting. And you can Google something, and it pops right up with the um, the news stories. <coughs> and a lot of the ad revenue from Google, not to the content provider. Mm -hmm. And the content provider would, would be the the news. The, nation, that's right? who should so be getting the advert. Right. People are still paying ads for 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 news. They're just not paying it on a physical piece of paper, print newspaper. Um, and even when it's online, that ad revenue is going to Google and it's not going to the Washington Post right. or the Houston Chronicle or whatever. Yeah. So it's an interesting thing that, and Google's making plenty of money. And I, I can see the side of the Australians where you know, tech, tech should pay some of the Something ad should go revenue to... they're getting to the people who created the content. In this case, it's news. Right. That's like we have the government, the democracy has a vested interest in, in having money go to the, the news organizations so that they can keep legitimate, you know, uh, free press around. And then the other thing, if Google or fa if Facebook just decides what's okay and what's not, and clearly there's been some stuff that's not okay recently, and there, there has to be some bounds. Mm -hmm. I, uh, but who decides that? Um, and so we really we need to have a public discussion. This is public interest. This isn't for sure private companies, private work. Um, there needs to be some transparent way that, you know, if, if you're going to restrict speech, it, that needs to be a publicly it, This can affect anybody. Way. And it, you know what? All speech is not protected. Right. You can't yell fire in a, in a crowded theater, right? Right. Um, you can't say anything you want anytime you want. Sure. But you can usually say anything you want at just about any time you want. So if you're going to restrict that freedom, it needs to be publicly, um, you know, transparent, yeah. but they also need to do it so that we don't have any more mobs trying to end our democracy. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a tough, um, uh, it's a tough, it is, question. but this yeah. is, but the, but the, the people who have been in Congress for 40 years who are completely out of touch with reality, <laughs> every, all the leaders in the country are all in their late seventies. Um, mm. you know, they, they're not able to think through these complicated, it's not not just Democrats are evil or Republicans suck. It's right. like we have to come up with some thoughtful policies here, and the the crowd that we have in Washington capable of doing that. I, I hope they are, and I hope they prove me wrong. But we got a lot of data points that show that they're not able to do that. Yeah, I grew up in America, and my parents are you know in Washington State. And, you know, my dad's like eighty five, and he's. He's never talked about a conspiracy in his life, but now they're talking conspiracy theories and all kinds of crazy stuff. Things have really shifted in America, and it's sad. Hopefully, we can get back on track. Yeah. 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 So I want to move on. You've got to figure it out. Yeah, I hope so. I want to move on a little bit here. Uh, this is kind of a, a hard question as well, I think. Uh, I know that you've been in the military. I know that you, through NASA, that you've been subject to probably more inoculations than most humans. So you've gone through a lot of vaccination processes, but this question, let's look at it here. So for example, for the safety of humankind, we quarantine billions of healthy people. We order everyone to wear a mask. We shut down businesses, bars and schools, et cetera, et cetera. You know, in the beginning, you could really understand that. You could say, hey, look, we better do this. This is important because 
we were talking about a mortality rate. I think it was about 3%, which is, you know, 30 times greater than the flu. So, but now we're a year into it. And what we're, what we're seeing, which I think is quite striking, we're hearing world leaders advocating to vaccinating the entire population. This is what they're saying. And this vaccination really has only been under development for about a year. And it usually takes, uh, most vaccines, it takes five to six years at the right. least to get to the sort of, to the populace. Uh, this vaccine hasn't been through phase three trials, hasn't been through thorough uh, uh, animal trials. There's no long-term data on adverse side effects. It was ramrated through FDA and the European medical agencies under the guise of emergency youth authorization acts, right? So I'm curious, like, your thought on, you know, you're, you're a commander of the, of the International Space Station, and your responsibility is for the crew and the ship, like some of our world leaders are, right? They have to take responsibility there. Right. How much sense yeah, so, does it, how much, yeah, how much right. sense does it make? this crusade to vaccinate the entire populace of the entire planet for a relatively standard respiratory virus does that dichotomy between this extreme quarantine to protect human and a rapid deployment of vaccines these to me look totally different so a couple thoughts there um covid is bad a, a friend of mine i might be dying today. Mm. Uh, he Condolences. called us to say goodbye a couple of days ago, and then he was recovering, and I haven't heard from him for a couple of days, and I just heard that he got bad again. So they, he's not, he's older, and anyway, um, it's it, a hundred thousand Americans is more than they lost in, in like World War One and World War Two and Vietnam and Korea. That's more than we lost in the twentieth century wars. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a bad disease. It's not the flu, but right. it, but it's not Ebola also. Yeah, you know, it, but it's still a bad, serious disease. Um, Wired magazine in November had a really great article about we should be vaccinating the social butterflies, and they had this interesting technique. This Israeli physicist came up with it. To, he basically said, "Ask somebody to name a person. I ask you to name somebody who you don't live with, and you you would name somebody, and then they would go vaccinate that person because the odds are you'll." vaccinate somebody that you know that has a lot of contact with people and the bottom line is if the bottom line is if you vaccinate the spreaders mm -hmm. you can stop the spread and, the, and this physicist said with 19 percent. now i'm not an immunologist like or you know, right. epidemiologist i can't say that that's a real thing or not but the mm -hmm. the point of it is really interesting what we're doing is we're vaccinating all the people who aren't spreading it <laughs> um so it's gonna we're doing it the slowest possible way to stop the the virus mm -hmm. but we're also that doesn't mean we're not going to save more lives because we're we're vaccinating the people that are most likely to die from it if you know if people in their 30s get it it's a really low mortality risk obviously right. um and so i i thought that would have been a great way to do it the thing that we could have done is really shut it down from the beginning um china did that and they recovered within a few months. They they had stopped it, not stopped it entirely, but they you know they got a billion and a half Slow people. They, they their economy was back to work really quickly because they took they would, were like just shut it down. If we had said you're not allowed to come out of your house for three weeks, eat eat your crusty bread and your frozen dinners, and don't even go to the grocery store, the virus would have died. And no trap, no international travel. You know, if we if we would have just shut it down, we would have had a couple weeks of hell. And then the virus would have been fixed, but that's not how we do things in America. We made fun of masks and said it's it's going to go away, and you know we we played it down entirely. I think if we would have handled it better from the beginning, we could have had a better thing. But Outcome, here we are, yeah. right? Yeah. The, so we have a year of data. Um, we have the vaccines coming out. I think rather than having one broad, this policy applies to everybody. I think that people who are unvaccinated and at risk really need to be careful. You know, if you're overweight, you need to be careful. Sure. If you're old, you need to be careful. Yeah. Um, if you're young and healthy, you know, if you're a kid, you need to be in school. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you're because the damage we're doing to kids, especially yeah. poor kids. Oh, you my know, God. With parents who are working and aren't at, 
you know, like if I had my kid, I, I and I could, I don't work. I mean, I'd work, but I work for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, they could have a great homeschooling experience. A lot of parents can't give their kids great homeschooling yeah. experience. And so the division that we have in society that's already bad yeah, is just getting worse from definitely. this COVID. So we need, we need to figure out how to have targeted response. But a really simple thing is like, guys, just wear a mask. And that, that it's not perfect, but it does stop some, it's a pretty low cost way to stop some spread. Um, and I, I've traveled internationally a couple times this in the last year, and I had to get a COVID test. And when I got to where I was going, I had to, you know, stay in the hotel for 24 hours or whatever. Yeah. And I had to get tested once I got there. Um, and it worked. They didn't have any COVID where I went. Mm -hmm. And so, but America has been having travel without requiring testing and stuff for a long time. Like the 40, we said we stopped the travel from China, but still 40,000 people came from China after we said that. And they right. were American citizens. So people say, well, they're Americans, let them come back. But you could at least quarantine them. Like, yeah, come on back, but just stay home for two weeks and don't spread it. They weren't quarantined? Um, so we just have, we haven't done simple things. We've done the really painful things. Joe Rogan is always harping on this, like shutting down restaurants. Right. Because that's killed the restaurant industry. Totally. Yeah. And um, he kind of has a point because you're allowed to go to the mall or you're allowed to work in an off, you know, in a factory, but you're not allowed to go to a restaurant. And he's got a point there. Sure. So I think we've caused pain that probably didn't need to be caused. But we've also didn't take it seriously when it should have been taken seriously. Um, and that that has led to a lot of unnecessary pain. So I would just wish we would have had a more intelligent, thoughtful uh, handling of it. Yeah, I agree. So here's another thought. So I want to say, for example, for me, there's a huge difference between like coercion and making free choice. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm anti-vax, but I'm also I'm definitely pro-choice. You know, right. our family, we're uh, really believers in holistic natural medicines. And, and we really believe in healthy lifestyle is one of the right. best ways to protect yourself, you know. Right. And. I think just about a week ago, it was the, the International Air Transport Association announced that they're going to launch a, a COVID-19 travel pass, which says we'll give travelers a way to display test results of confirmed that they received the vaccination. Hmm. My thought is, uh, you know, should medical intervention be a personal choice and not something to be forced on people by businesses? You know, what's your thoughts as a father, as a leader? And what's your response yeah. to this? Um, so, <clears throat> I mean, nobody should vaccinate you against your will, uh, but I'm going to get the vaccine because I don't want to get COVID. Yeah. Um, and there's enough. I mean, it did rush it, of course, but the mRNA technology that I think AstraZeneca and Moderna used, mm -hmm. um, that technology has been in development for a long time. So, and although the trials happen quickly, there's been millions and millions and millions of vaccinations. So by the time I get it, you know, we'll, we'll know uh, if, if something bad's happening. And so far, there hasn't been any really bad results that I know of anyway. My parents got um, their my parents got their first shot about yeah. a week ago, two weeks ago, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. It was hard for him to get. And my, my dad was pissed. He was like, oh, they can't even get this to vaccine in time. But anyway, they got those. <laughs> My mom, yeah, my mom had the same experience. She had her second shot today, so okay. my stepdad's waiting on his second shot. So, um, it's it's, you know, it's not I, that easy I'm to get. It's amazing how quickly they've gotten it. And yeah, their yeah. neighbors died from it, so I, you know, I want them to get it. Sure. Um, uh, but and they they want to come see their grandkids graduate from college and stuff, and, and the vaccine just makes that possible. So, but if you, you know, if you don't want to get it, the reality is though, if you don't vaccinate then you're benefiting from everybody else vaccinating. But as long as a certain, as long as enough people do it, it'll stop the, it'll stop the virus. The problem is I just heard today on the news is one of these viruses, the South African variant yeah. reduced the effic mm. efficacy right. of the means by like five times, which basically that's bad. That's yeah. really bad. Right. Well, I, I grew up, you know, on a farm in Yakima. So the shingles, <coughs> Um, my mom just got shingles Okay, and it was like the worst thing that's, that's ever happened. It was painful and mm, I didn't know yeah, you could get is. a shingles vaccine. It's horrible. But you can. Yeah. And I, I got it. Okay. And, uh, so hopefully I don't get shingles now. Well, hopefully not, especially since you've been vaccinated. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows? Yeah. But um, it didn't it didn't sound like something I wanted to get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I grew up on a farm, and I was subject to a lot of you know. I did a lot of work for my dad, driving the tractor in the fields and cutting the grass, doing a lot of spraying. But at a really young age, I started developing some pretty severe allergic reactions. My eyes were swelling up, and eventually I ended up in the hospital, and I was given, uh, what's that, epinephrine? Yeah. And oh, wow. Yeah, so it was, you know, I had a couple bad bad sort of allergy days, and so they thought I was a good candidate for, uh, for it, it's like an inoculation where they basically test you for grass pollens, dust, molds, and they shoot a little of that in your skin, and if you swell up, well, that's what you're allergic to. And then eventually they start giving, I had weekly inoculations in the back of my arms where they basically are shooting small doses of that into you. And it nearly killed me. So they had to stop this trial process on me. So I had that really bad experience. And I've had my whole life, you know, like uh, allergies and I, I got right. arthritis pretty early and stuff. And But that's one of the reasons where I'm sort of... Uh, Ooh, I don't know if I want to start getting into that again. I took a lot of vaccines when I traveled, you know, yellow fever, yeah. typhoid, and all yeah. that normal right. stuff. But so yeah, every, you don't want to every, get those. Everybody's those body's things. different, and that's the thing yes. that you've got to be careful with mm-hmm. when you. That that shingles vaccine hurt. I mean, the the shot yeah. was fine, but like my arm was sore for over a week, and the day after I got it, I was like, I could feel my body. It's gone. Not shutting down, but you know, my body was not happy. It really, I, I've never had that that sort of experience from seeing any shot I've ever gotten. That was a pretty intense um, thing. It, a couple of days later, it was fine, but um, yeah. <laughs> and I had, I, I got skin cancer. Incredibly disgusting. How much my immune system reacts to this treatment, and I, w- I was doing it, and I could feel, I could literally feel my organs shutting down. I, I really? had to stop the treatment. I, uh, it was over the weekend, so I couldn't talk to my doctor. And I called him on Monday, and he was like, "Oh my God, stop! Yeah, don't do it. If, uh-huh. if your organs are shutting down, stop that treatment." Right. So sometimes your body can react to medicine in bad ways. You yeah, gotta, everybody has you to be different. smart about that. Right. Yeah. True. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Well, you have been quite a an astound, a, a outstanding leader in life. You have been surrounded by leaders throughout your life. What makes a great leader, and who are some of those individuals that stood out and inspired you along the way? That's a great question. Uh, honestly, Neil Armstrong is one of the best. He, I was, you know, he was the first man on the moon, but um, just as a test pilot, and he was always calm. He was never, you know, a, a yeller or uptight or whatever. He had a very calm demeanor about him. And he didn't say a lot, but when he spoke, people listened. Um, and I, so I always liked that about him, um, as opposed to you know people who were yelling and screaming. And so I, he was he was definitely somebody that I like. Another leader that I really looked up to that I loved was George H. W. Bush. Um, again, he was he. I'm so I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm I'm a very moderate middle middle kind of guy. Uh, and H. W. is a pretty moderate Republican and was that was senior so well, senior yeah he was so well prepared for that job he had been a congressman he had been an oil man he left his rich fancy east coast lifestyle to live mm-hmm. in midland texas in the 40s which was like you know yeah the farm dirt dirt and and tumbleweeds and mm-hmm. and um they he so he really people think of him as like this fancy rich he he made his own way in the oil industry and and he was a CIA director. He was an ambassador to China. Right. Um, you know, vice president of Reagan. So he was he was a real at a at the time she wrote him a letter thanking him for taking the time to meet us and our kid. And like a mm. month later we got this handwritten note from him. Wow. Um, mm. and in his book he used to write he spent Saturdays um uh writing letters. That was a Saturday That's a personal touch. Saturday morning was to write letters to his constituents or whatever. So he he did that for us, and he didn't know me. I wasn't an ash. I was just some, some guy. It wasn't like, you know, he knew me. Mm-hmm. So anyway, he he's a guy that I really look up to a lot. Right on. You know the the letter he left for Bill Clinton is legendary. Um, yeah. If you haven't read it, Google it. Just read yeah, the read, read the letter that George H W Bush left for Bill Clinton on the on the Resolute desk in the right. Oval Office. That was a pretty brutal election. 
and they were, you know, and he, he, he was a class act. All right. We'll check that out. Well, you know, Terry, with, the, with all the exploration that you've, you have been doing and you're still doing, I think, mm-hmm. um, I couldn't imagine your family is as a solid as a rock supporting you, you know, watching you take off floating in space and enduring the, the times and long days that uh, you're not with them. So how is your wife, your, your kids taking all of this? Well, it's, it's hard on a family. I'm actually divorced now. Oh. And uh, the, the astronaut career is, is um, you know, can be really tough on families. I'm, oh, that's okay. one of the things that I'm writing right now with that theme. Um, but they, you know, they were great. It, it's hard. I've got a picture of them watching me launch and it's just this giant white ball. Mm-hmm. So you don't know if I've exploded or what. And then oh. it takes 10 or 20 seconds and then you see the shuttle, you see the shuttle climbing out of this giant fireball. And, uh, you know, as astronauts, it's a very selfish job because it's all about you're the hero. Everybody wants to talk to you. You're the all-American hero. Mm. You're, you get to fly in space and they ha- they get to sit at home and wonder if you're going to you know, make, make it, it back. Or not. So it's a it's right. a tough yeah. it's a challenge for for families, for sure. And then, you know, at least for me and for the fighter pilots, you're you're compartmentalized and it's um, yeah. whatever. And when I, when I was flying, my kids were. You, you were young for my first flight. For my second flight, they were teenagers. So it was actually kind of a good time to be in space for 200 days, yeah. leaving teenagers <laughs> behind. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they, they don't fully understand. I think they're starting to understand more now as they get older. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, my son is studying the Columbia and Challenger accidents in, in his engineering, uh, for his Quiet engineering degree there, in college. Yeah. And he's like, wow, did you know they did this? I'm like, yeah, I know the guy who did that. And mm-hmm. so... Anyway, they they appreciate things later, but right in on. the moment, it's hard to appreciate it. Sure. Um, Aside from that, is there anything else you want to explore? <laughs> the problem with being an astronaut is that your bucket list gets too long. Uh, and I, <laughs> I say that a lot, and it's true. Yeah. Um, so just seeing this for seven months, there's a lot of places on Earth I want to do. Um, I love directing, and so I'd love, I'd love to direct feature films or you know things like that. I've got a lot to learn. Um, but I've got a few projects in the work that I, that I want to do that. Um, I've got a couple TV shows that I want to do, but one of them would, is one where I go and visit all the places I saw from and just get to know the people, you know, what, what live here, what do you eat? You know? And mm-hmm. so it would be, it would be a way to show that people, no matter where they're at, but also see these really cool extreme, you know, the Philippines or whatever, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> Siberia, uh, Krakatoa, volcanoes of Indonesia, the jungles of Africa. There's a lot of cool places on Earth that I want to visit and see. Definitely. There's That's a lot cool. of cool stuff here. Janet and I started traveling pretty young. It's been a, one of the greatest things, one of the greatest uh, learning tools for me throughout life. So really an advocate of travel and expanding Absolutely. our horizons, so to speak. And that's the irony. That's the irony of it all, you know? It's like you thought you knew everything. You thought you saw everything. And, but once you've done that experience... It just dawns to you, and you realize that like, there's so much more to explore out there. You know, so there like, is. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Keep exploring. Yeah. Yeah. So Terry, uh, I think we're running out of time. Wanna, yeah. Want to thank. Two hours. Yeah. yeah. Pretty it's cool like a stuff. Rogan podcast. <laughs> yeah. Watch out, Joe. He's you know he's gonna step aside. We're coming up on him real quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I st- so I started my own podcast too. Uh, down to earth with Terry Verts and cool. um, I've only done a few episodes, but they've each been about an hour and a half long. There's just yeah. a lot to talk about. Yeah, yeah, man. You know, what's really cool is uh, you get to share this time with somebody and you share this information and I, we find, you know, we're, we're really new at it. I think this is uh your number eight, our eighth episode. And at the end of it, when you, when you get off the, the podcast, you're like, wow, man, that was cool. I really feel great and lifted by all these new thoughts, yeah. these inspiring things. And, this information we're sharing information you're learning from others while bettering yourself you know so it's it's pretty cool stuff i like it and thank you today i interviewed the chris benninger she's the ceo of guide dogs for the blind okay yeah um trains golden retrievers and labs to help blind people it's amazing it was the coolest yeah i was i i was really happy after i was done with that yeah yeah it's a great feeling 
Yeah, congratulations. How, how long have you been doing this and how many shows you got? The, she was number four. All so right. it hasn't dropped yet. It's going to drop. I think next we just got approval on iTunes and so uh, and Spotify. So I yeah. think it comes out next week. My producer is going to start dropping one a week. Yeah, that's we'll what we're doing the one a week. And, yeah. you yeah. know, it's a family project for us. So we're mm -hmm. doing all the editing, right. all the website, all the stuff together. My son has really become an incredible editor. Yeah. <laughs> so that's good. not editing is hard. It, oh, is. it is. Editing is. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. part of his uh, his homeschooling, actually. He's 14 years oh, cool. old. Yeah. Well. Uh, and and his homeschooling, I might add, he, he wrote out the questions today or was part of that yeah. homeschool project. Can, can I job. ask one? Yeah. Can I ask one question that he sure. wrote? Like, how high is the atmosphere? So, um, it's for thousands of miles, like one molecule per cubic meter or something right. like their atmosphere goes up pretty high uh you're by the time you get to either 50 miles or 100 kilometers um dropped out you know above what well, you at mount everest mm -hmm. so how many feet is mount everest 20 29 yeah 29,000 so 29,000 29, so yeah. plus meters there's not a lot of air <laughs> yeah um at 100,000 feet, there's really above 50,000 feet. They say your blood can boil. Wow. Um, above 100,000 feet, instantly, right? There's not enough air. And above a couple hundred thousand feet, you know, above that altitude. So it's that's a tough question to ask. But yeah. <laughs> 100 kilometers is you're pretty much in space. You get yeah. a, you get astronaut wings in the Air Force above 50 miles. Okay. All right. So. Yeah, usually, like in diving, it's 14.7 uh, psi uh, mm -hmm. seawater, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And right. I, that's how they measure an atmosphere. But I, he asked me that question, and I said, well, I, that's a good question. Right. I don't know how to <laughs> answer it. Well, um, uh, we wish that the... It, we it gets thinner and thinner. Even at the space station, yeah. Go the ahead. space station's 400 kilometers up, and oh, there's yeah, still there. some atmosphere there. The, at, the atmospheric drag on the space station lowers it by a few meters every day maybe 10 meters a day it depends on the sun's activity actually oh. um, so there's a little bit of very 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 if you open your visor you would die instantly but there's uh. still there's still a few molecules. even an atmosphere on the moon it's super 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 thin if you open your visor you would die instantly mm. but there's a bit of gas uh, around the moon how cold is it outside the space station when you do a spacewalk i'm curious about that because when you know how, how much protection the, you know, the insulation on the suit <clears throat> go ahead i i've seen different numbers it's roughly plus or minus 250 degrees um uh, fahrenheit for red energy and the temperature is just means something else if you know when you're in the sun it's really hot and when you're in nighttime it gets really cold i remember feeling cold one night and um when I was on a spacewalk and as soon as the sun rose, I warmed up instantly like that mm. second. Mm. And then I was got really hot one time, but it was a heat that I had never felt before. Cause it was like in it was like needles jamming me heat. It wasn't like Houston or it wasn't like the Philippines where it's just the air is hot and humid and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, or you jump into 40 degree pool and you scream like a little girl cause it's so cold. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're in 40 degree air, it's cold, but it's you're okay. Um, in space, the temperature can is just a number because right. there's no thermal inertia. Right. So the, the temperature kind of is meaningless in terms of human experience on Earth. Right. Oh, wow. I'm learning a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great show. Great to be here. Yeah. So when an, another thought I, yeah. I was thinking about was... Uh, you know, I've I've done a lot of stuff up in the high latitudes, and uh, you know, like in the winters we have uh, constant uh, night, and during the summers we have you know constant yeah. day, right? And I was really curious. I know how it affects me there. Like in the in the summer, I'm like I'm up all night, I'm up all day, I'm a twenty hour day guy every day. Right. So how does that affect you when you're going around the Earth? What is it every ninety minutes? How does that that yeah. sun that that affects your your sleeping habits you know it doesn't we on on our watch we have um gmt so we're on london time 
and you wake up and you based on London time as has season sun is off the left or right it's not on your nose if it's on your nose you're half in sunlight half in darkness but mm -hmm. if the sun's off to the side as you're going around the earth you're constantly okay. um and okay. so uh that was not fun the first day it's kind of really cool but after a day or two of that it was like you couldn't see anything on earth that was always easy you could never make out anything on the ground you could never see the stars because the sun was up so it was this weird kind of mm. limbo for a week of high beta wow uh, so it was kind of yeah. interesting to have yeah. a season in space i'd never heard anybody talk about that before but it was honestly it was kind of depressing when the, when we finally had our first sunset after a week of no, no sunsets it was like a <laughs> oh, celebration on the where's spaceship. the sun going sun cool. salutation yeah. right All right cool <laughs> All right. So, Terry, thank you so much for all your uh, views and perspectives and sharing uh, your time with us today. What a great show. Uh, what a great uh, time. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And send me the link when, when it's ready. I'll, I'll post it. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Long live and right. prosper. Bye. Thank all you. Bye-bye. Right. All right. <laughs> See bye -bye. you, bud. Take